students. Our phone's on board. And let's bring them in closely. We've had some people say they have a little bit of trouble hearing us. Good evening. Thank you for the full house this evening. Good to see all of you. I am bringing the Monday, February 14th, Lakota Board of Education meeting to order. Jenny, would you please call the roll? Mr. Adi? Yeah. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Yeah. Mrs. Bodie? Yes. Mrs. Schaefer? Here. Mrs. O'Connor? Here. Mrs. Casper, would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Kelly. We'll move to number four on the agenda. I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Mr. D. Do I have a second? Mm -hmm. Second. Sorry. Thank you, Mrs. Bodie. Jenny? Mr. Adi? Here. Mrs. Bodie? Here. I really need a, a yes, yes or, or no. no. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. Schaefer? Yes. And Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, board. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, board President's comments. I just wanted to make um, one announcement. We are going to be moving to just one board meeting in March due to some conflicts that we have. On our March 28th board meeting, we will also have the facilities committee meeting prior to the board meeting. So March 28th will be the facilities committee meeting from four to six. And the regular board meeting will start at 6.30 and that will be our only regular board meeting for March. Soup. Um, just to um, thank all of, all of you for being here and also to acknowledge all the excitement uh, leading up to the game last night with our kids and families and how exciting that was. And I know the outcome wasn't what we wanted, but uh, we got a shout out from Coach Taylor. Thanks to Mr. Horton um, at last night's game or after the game. So it's pretty cool for our kids. And I know that they were like, they like to see the excitement. And by being in school today, we got to celebrate Valentine's Day. So thank you to all of you that brought your significant others tonight to our board meeting to celebrate <laughs> um, Valentine's Day. That's it. Thank you. Um, Treasurer? I have no comments at this time. All right, we'll move to student spotlight, one of the highlights of every regular board meeting. Good evening. This year, our students are reaping the benefits of the changes we have implemented to gifted services. Our gifted intervention specialists have not only joined the classroom teacher where there are groups of gifted students, but targeted professional development has enabled our classroom teachers to instruct gifted students as well. This has tripled the number of students who are able to receive gifted services, increasing from 400 to 1,200. Our gifted services department has also added a new opportunity for instruction in English Language Arts Plus. That's where tonight's student spotlight comes in. Students across the country in grades three through six are able to compete in three Word Masters Challenge events. This national vocabulary competition uses critical thinking skills as it tests students' abilities to complete analogy solving problems. Tonight, we're celebrating sixth grader, Jadel Fetzing, and fourth grader, Robbie Bauer. Jadel is from Cherokee and Robbie is from Union Elementary School. They walked away from the first competition with perfect scores. Across the country, only 11 fourth graders and 15 sixth graders achieved this feat. Wow. Please welcome Robbie and Jadel. Hi, my name is Jadel, and I am a sixth grade student at Cherokee Elementary. Board member, Sup Superintendent, Mr. Miller, Treasurer, Treasurer, Mrs. Logan, and community members, thank you for giving me this chance to be recognized for what I've accomplished. 
I took the word master's analogy test and I was one of 15 people in the country to get a perfect score. I think that it was very useful to prepare for the test step by step. The steps I took to do this included studying in class with preparation tests the teachers would give us to get a feel for analogies. They also gave us an analogy notebook to study different words and learn their adjectives and nouns, et cetera. They, I also started to study the meanings of many different words to widen my knowledge of word definitions. Another big part of preparing was getting my mind, getting my mind right to fully gauge everything and think clearly and to find the most reasonable answer. The test in general was where you would have to match up the best words possible with the analogy the test would give you. The test ended up being way more challenging than the practice test that our teachers gave us. <laughs> the test really made me think about which word combinations fit best with the one on the question. It gave a ton of similar answers that were very tricky. After completing the test, I was really unsure on how well I did. I was very surprised when Mrs. Alexander came to me and told me that I got a 20 out of 20 on the test and received the perfect score. As I think about my future plans as a student, taking this test and being recognized for it would look very good on a resume. I hope to eventually get into a prestigious school like Harvard. A family member of mine has also gone to Harvard and we've talked about taking advantage of opportunities like advanced classes doing well in school and being disciplined, especially not only with schoolwork, but in soccer. Again, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share about my experience with analogies and the positive impact it will, con it will continue to make on my life. Hi, my name is Robbie Bow, and I'm a fourth grade leader here at Union. So I made flashcards to study for the test on um, Quizlet. Um, I would, my teacher gave us words to go through and I made flashcards on pieces of paper as well. And every night I would go through them and my parents would give me the definition of a term and I would have to say it. Um, I liked the test because it was challenging and I had, I can make my mind grow. Robbie, would you mind explaining to people so they, that they know what Quizlet is? You mentioned Quizlet early, so I think most of the adults might not know what that is. Um, Quizlet is where you can study vocab words and my teacher makes some every week. What kind of, what kind of platform do you use or how do you get to Quizlet? Um, through Canvas. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. There's and also someone. games to play on Quizlet. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Robbie. Robbie and Jado, would you come back up to the microphone for just a moment? Okay, board, any comments or questions for them? Come on up, guys, step up closer. I, yeah. There you go. I am so impressed with all of your preparation work. It sounds like you guys worked really hard with your teachers and used the tricks that they gave you and really monopolized on that. I think great things are ahead with all that preparation you're already doing in elementary school. So I can't wait to see where you end up. Yeah, um, what I'm going to say to both of you is uh, you've done a good job. Uh, the key words that I heard tonight is tests and challenges. You've been tested and you've proven yourself. Expect more and you're going to have more challenges in life. And you started doing well and you're going to do great. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Wow, pretty impressive. Did you guys enjoy the test? even though it was harder than you thought? 
what do each of you think you want to do when you go to college? Like, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> okay, that's okay. Some of us don't know what we want to be when we grow up. So we'd like to have a shout out to your teachers too for all their help and your Sorry. principals and assistant principals who are here tonight to cheer you on. So thank them as well. Yes, you guys did a great job. And um, I know that it took a lot of problem solving to try to get um, through all the quizzes and all the time that it took to get to your final um, final test. And you guys aced it. So good job. Jadel, you mentioned soccer. So something else to keep you well-rounded. So tell me about your favorite position and what team you follow. Currently play for... I currently play for um, the CU Elite team. Um, my favorite position would probably be left midfielder. Mm -hmm. And I'm left footed and right footed. Oh. So I'm good with using both of my feet. So. Wow. Nice. Favorite team to follow? If you have one? Not really. Not really? Okay. <laughs> good. I like that you're well rounded. That's great. Robbie, I'm sure you are too. Mrs. Logan, anything? No, I, I'm always impressed when our students come and perfect scores um, and nationwide, like you are in an elite group of students and we're just so proud of you. We're thankful you're ours. <laughs> 15 across the United States is, is an amazing number. Really, really, we are all so proud of you guys and, and thank you for being our great ambassadors for our district. We appreciate that. We are going to take a picture and give you something and would like your teachers and your administrators to come up and be part of that picture too, please. If parents or grandparents want to get up, you can get up. Take a picture, it's okay. I know it is my favorite part of meetings. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you all. That's one of our favorite parts of our meeting, so we appreciate it. We're gonna to move to seven on the agenda public comment. We have a sign-in sheet that we've had people sign up for. You do not need to state your address if you don't want to, but please say your name when you come up and your address is already registered here if you've signed in. We are going to ask you to try to hold it to three minutes, please, and we'll go to 30 minutes before the end of public comment. So first up, Mrs. Grindler. And following Mrs. Grindler will be Dana Richardson. Do you tilt the mic up just a bit? Oh. Just tilt it up. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Thank okay, you. Great. 
Um, I'm Penny Greenler. I'm speaking tonight to make sense of the COVID resolution before the board. The resolution coming before the board says there is substantive doubt as to the effectiveness of masks and overwhelming incontrovertible evidence of serious health risks. Science says face masks are unlikely to cause overexposure to carbon dioxide, even in patients with lung disease. Respiratory droplets you exhale that land on the inside of your mask and then breathe back will not give you bacterial pneumonia. When coughing, surgical masks reduce the spread of droplets from four feet down to six inches. The CDC in February, 2022 said the odds of infection were lowest among persons typically wearing an N95 or KN95 mask. Data shows Michigan schools without mask mandates saw a 62% more coronavirus spread. The resolution coming before the board says, children only have a minute risk of serious illness due to COVID. Science says reported COVID-19 cases among children have spiked dramatically in 2022 during the Omicron variant surge, almost 4.2 million child cases were reported since the beginning of January, 2022. Child cases this week were over double the peak level of the Delta surge in 2021. The resolution coming before the board says that data and evidence demonstrating the current variants of COVID-19 are even less threatening. Science says the Omicron variant did not come from the Delta variant. It came from a completely part, different part of the virus's family tree. And since we don't know where the virus family tree of a new variant is going to come from, we cannot know how pathogenic it might be. It could be less pathogenic, but it could just as easily be more pathogenic. The resolution coming before the board says that the United Kingdom has ended mandatory face masking. Science says leading UK scientists have warned that future variants of COVID-19 could be much more dangerous and a cause for higher numbers of deaths and cases in serious Omicron, serious illness than Omicron. Many of them say that the caution needs to be taken lifting the last COVID restrictions in England. At the same time, demands are growing for the government's most senior advisors on COVID to hold a press conference to reveal what evidence there was to back the decision to end all pandemic restrictions. The resolution coming before the board says that natural immunity is evidence to be superior to vaccinations. Science says vaccinations in the COVID recovered may provide incremental protective benefit, but COVID naive individuals should not seek infection to bypass the vaccination. Mrs. Grimble, may I ask you to wrap up? Yes. Um, Masking is irritating and inconvenient, but it is not a loss of freedom. Getting sick, hospitalized, or dying from COVID is a loss of freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Richardson is up, and Jedediah Plastid is up next. Good evening. My name is Dana Richardson. I have two children in the district. They both still love going to school and are enjoying their school year. My sixth grader especially is enjoying band since it was restarted at the, in the elementary schools this semester. It's been nice to be on the other side of this COVID peak. We've seen a continued loosening of COVID guidance and restrictions nationally and with from our own health department. Our own department made changes to guidelines recently indicating the shift the proposed resolution regarding COVID policies seems to be beyond the scope of this board. It also contains many medical and scientific inaccuracies, which the previous speaker just spoke to. I can speak to that personally myself being um, a registered nurse and healthcare worker. The supporting documents, and yes, I did read through the majority of them, consist of inflammatory news stories, opinion pieces, and editorials. The limited research articles can be directly refuted by updated studies and more relevant research. When I requested, when I made the request for the document several weeks ago, I also requested the names of the authors of this resolution or the source names of the original authors if it was a document that was taken from other sources. 
and I've not heard the answer to that question. I'd like to remind the board that according to its own code of ethics and conduct, they should render all decisions on availability of facts and independent judgment rather than succumbing to the influence of individual or special interest groups. Another question I have about this resolution is to ask how much money has been spent on legal fees to review this resolution since it was first brought up last month. I ask this not to discourage the board from referring to legal when it's needed, but as a point of financial transparency as other potentially contentious policies are soon to come up in the future. We as a district had complacency with our last election, but people are paying attention now. I encourage you to remember your role as public servants to serve this public school district, not a political party agenda or a special interest group. We are here to stand up for Lakota. Thank you, Mrs. Richardson. Mr. Plasted is up next and Amy Reg Herman is up on deck. Uh, some of what I wrote to speak tonight um, is not all agenda related. Um, would you like me to go later towards the public? Just agenda related, please. So, but it's it's kind of intermixed. You split it between the two. Not the way I wrote it. Go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, as parents, one of our main priorities is to protect our children and to raise them to be good people, to care about their fellow man. To many of the adults in this district, this pandemic has been framed as living in fear rather than taking necessary precautions to ensure the safety of those around us. Our kids are watching us. We sit here and listen to members of the board pushing political agendas in a, a position that should be entirely nonpartisan, health and safety, ensuring the district has funds to provide the best learning environment they can properly credentialed staff. These are not partisan issues. The welfare of our children should never be put at the mercy of politically charged and divisive opinions. Parents want choice when it comes to their child's education. I don't think any of us disagree with this and you have that option. However, pulling funds from the district has the potential to have a devastating impact on the district, especially as we saw the projected growth of new students in the 124 meeting. Reverting COVID protocols to March 2020 without basing the decision on verified and peer reviewed data is dangerous. We all hate the masks and quarantines and distancing. We all want to live our lives normally again. Despite the drop in cases throughout Butler County, we're not quite there yet. Masks and quarantine procedures still need to be in place in order to keep the numbers low and decreasing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Plastic. This is Reg Herman is up and Rusty Jesse will be up after that. Hi, I'm Amy Raguraman. Um, today I'm here to oppose a policy that is going to be introduced tonight. Um, it was 2210 from the policy meeting and it is stating that any kind of um, concerns about classroom specific materials should be changed right now it's supposed to go through the superintendent and at this point this resolution would instead go through individual board members and to me i think this would be an extremely dangerous slippery slope to allow individual board members to dictate and micromanage what teachers are going to be using in their classroom um, we hire teachers for their subject matter expertise and it is not the board's job to tell teachers how to teach um, we've already there's already been a concern about staff shortages in Lakota and about teachers leaving. And my fear is that if the board starts trying to micromanage every single piece of teaching material, that I can promise that teachers are going to leave our district due to this. Um, plus, as mentioned at the last policy committee, if there is, if parents do have concerns about books or other instructional materials, there's a policy 9130. It's called the Public Complaint and Dispute Resolution where parents can address any specific concerns. Um, and just like any discipline procedures or any other concerns, you know, I feel it should always, should always start with the teacher and the school first before going you know, straight to the board. And we need you know, kind of an independent arbitrator to, to understand the full picture of what is going on. So again, I think this should, we need to keep the policy as it is. 
uh, where any concerns about classroom materials should go through the superintendent and not through individual board members, making it even more difficult um, if, if you're having like individual board members at any point, like asking for specific materials. Um, again, so th thank you for your time. Thank you. Rusty Jesse is up. This is Kate Redestage will be up next. Rusty Jesse, I'm uh, up about uh, policy 169.1 tonight. I, uh, I think it's an improvement over what the previous board uh, put out there, but I still think there's issues with it. Uh, one question I have is on the front page, it says uh, at every regular and special meeting of the board, are work sessions included in that as a regular or a special or is that a separate category? And then another one is if on the second page on renum or re, uh, re letter D, individuals may not register others to speak during public participation. I'm concerned about that uh, because I think it may violate American Disabilities Act. Um, my dad had strokes in 2015. He died two years ago. We couldn't understand, I couldn't understand a word he said the last year of his life, but his brain still worked. He had a tablet. If he could have punched something out, and if he was a resident of Lakota, he still had a right as a US citizen to be heard. This does not make any allowance for that. If we have, and I don't know what the correct terminology is today, but if we have someone that is mute and cannot speak and they have to sign based on how I read this, someone could not come up. It could be a teacher wanting to, they couldn't have a student or a spouse or anyone Oddly convey their concerns to the board. So I think that this needs to go back and uh, be reviewed a little bit. And also on the curriculum, I was wondering as well about that. Um, is, uh, will everything go through the board? Or I mean, is Matt the center point? And then if you guys hear something, you wanna see it before it's implemented, is that how that's kinda of gonna be looked at? And then uh, the third thing I have is when is the actual final agenda posted? Because I went out there over the weekend and I, you know, saw a few things attached to the agenda. And, you know, about five o'clock, Mary said, hey, look at all this stuff. And there were a lot more attachments that I didn't see. And I'm assuming some other folks may not have seen. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jesse. This is Breda Stidges up next. And Mr. Tony Kruger is on deck. Mr. Kruger, Mr. Bredestich, Mrs. Bredestich will go next and then you'll be right after her. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, also, before I started, um, I had a multifaceted uh, speech. I can break it up, but would I be permitted to speak later on the non-agenda items? Since we've started the process, we'll go ahead and let you speak on it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, I would first uh, like to thank you for the opportunity to speak and also to ask about previous week's questions about the Zoom policy that several people had brought up and asked about um, and if any decision had been made, because uh, that has been brought up at least twice by a number of people, uh, I think as far back as five weeks ago. Um, so checking to see if there's been any decision that's been made in regards to the Zoom policy. Um, I would also like to request that the board would make a definitive show of support or rejection for House Bill 290, uh, which is more commonly known as the backpack bill. Um, the bill would strip resources from our district, and I would request that each board member uh, give a position on support or, support or rejection of that bill. Um, it would seem very counterintuitive for board members to actively uh, hurt our our finances in our district. Um, the agenda item that I would like to speak against is the resolution brought forward uh, at the previous board meeting in regards to choosing to actively disregard uh, health directives by the state of Ohio meant to keep us safe during a pandemic. Um, it seems like it would open the district up to a lot of potential legal liability by doing so and choosing to actively 
uh, reject the Ohio Department of Health's directives. Um, not only that, but why would we as individuals with no medical expertise uh, be making decisions that would assume to know more than public health, health experts and medical experts who have spent decades of their lives studying these diseases. Uh, I would strongly advocate for the board to reject this resolution and to be led by science and medicine and not unproven uh, biased and conspiracy theory, internet websites and, websites and opinion pieces. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kruger. And following Mr. Kruger will be Diane Curtis. I would like to address the agenda meeting uh, that being brought up this evening about the mandates for masking. Um, if indeed the health department has the authority to mandate, then I say require them to make a decision. If they do not have that ability and it's within the realm of this board to eliminate the mandates, to mask, I say, eliminate the masks. I believe that we're in a different situation now than we were two years ago. The analogy that I would give is this. The Delta is like the LA Rams. The Omicron is like Lakota West high school football. They're good, but they can't beat the Bengals. The situation is very clear. We're in a different situation with the Omicron. It's not that serious, and we're hurting our children by not allowing them to have an identity. My ninth grade grandson brought home his class picture of over 100 children. I couldn't find him. He was masked. We can't mask our children. So please do what you can, whatever is necessary. Let's get rid of this masking. 70,000 people last night said we should. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kruger. Mrs. Cook, you're here in the audience. Did, did you want to speak tonight? Okay, you'll be up. I have you checked off and I wasn't sure what you wanted to do. Did you want to speak on the agenda? Okay, you'll be up after Mrs. Curtis. I'm sorry I missed you the first time through. Mrs. Curtis. Hi. Um, so last night while watching the Super Bowl, I saw Jay-Z, Matt Damon, Jennifer Lopez, Ben Affleck, Emmett Smith, all not wearing masks and surrounded by others not wearing masks. While this is in LA County, California, the kids in that area were all still mandated to attend school with a mask that next day. Uh, mask mandates seem to only show that elites are superior and working classes to submit. This is not the way of the United States of America. Even in the Washington Post, February 11th stated in large headline font, mask mandates didn't make a difference anyway. Scholars from John Hopkins have even documented studies that masks are actually causing negative psychological effects on our youth. I hear many people talk about science tells us that masks work. Yes, in a hospital they do. But the problem I'm seeing is that the conversation about masks has been politicized by the nation, not by us, by the nation, by media, by even all the way up to the White House. 
And those that have differing views or have other facts that show that masks don't work or vaccinations don't work are actually silenced um, and actively silenced. Um, this has even been brought up against uh, Fauci. Um, so as far as the CDC, and uh, they were the same people that actually stopped landlords from evicting their tenants. So I don't understand how we're looking at agencies like the government, which seem to be corrupted with whatever money from Soros and stuff like that. Um, even the OSHA mandates with uh, that as well seem to overstep their bounds and had to have the Supreme Court and others to stop them. So I don't believe that mask should be working. I agree with you guys for getting rid of the mask and thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Kearns. Mrs. Cook is up and then Mrs. Erdo is following. <clears throat> Good evening. I did not have a very polished, prepared speech today, so but I am going to share some thoughts that I think are really important. Um, I want to thank the board members um, for moving toward honoring both student and parental choice with regard to masks, vaccinations, and medical choice. Um, while I recognize that there are strong feelings and opinions on both sides of this issue, I firmly believe that respecting all persons and their personal choices is paramount in this issue, uh, just as I would never advocate someone who has very valid concerns being prohibited from wearing a mask, even though there have previously been policies in some schools previous to COVID that prohibited face coverings. Um, if someone has a concern, I would never prohibit that. But I also believe those who have valid concerns for not wearing a mask need to also be respected. So I'm advocating for mutual respect, recognizing that there is um, strong feeling on both sides of this and strong concern regarding the science, um, both in August and September, as well as tonight with the Johns Hopkins studies, I have examined many scientific articles that were not just inflamed partisan opinion um, by many peer reviewed, their peer reviewed doctors, some of the most highly esteemed peer reviewed doctors who have also come out on both sides of this issue. So I don't think that we can stand up here as a citizen and just say that we have all the answers for this, but I do think that we need to be respecting everyone. Um, as far as the, the information that was shared about the Omicron and all the child cases, I would contend that those cases were not life-threatening cases, just as most cases of strep and throat flu and other things are not life-threatening to children. Um, with regard to loss of freedom, that was also mentioned earlier today, um, I would contend that um, there's also loss of freedom on the part of many people who have a very difficult time with the mask there. I have a very difficult time with the mask. I have been unable to teach, um, even though I am a teacher, because I could not wear a mask all day long. I barely can wear the mask for two hours when I'm helping my students' classroom. And usually I'm taking it below my nose when I'm away from everybody or in the hallway. So I think that, um, and I've seen other people who are retiring because of not wanting to wear a mask and not wanting to deal with this, um, both in our education system and in other places. So I just think that we really need to be uh, recognizing that we are a community and focusing on unity and mutual respect in these areas. So I really support moving toward that. Um, I encourage the board to examine the science on both sides, recognizing that there are articles on both sides. Regarding curriculum considerations, um, I firmly believe that the board has the right and the obligation to review what is being taught in our schools. Um, although I am a teacher and teachers are professionals, all teachers have different political ideologies and personal ideologies. And as teachers, our responsibility is to teach factual content and not to teach our own personal ideologies. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mrs. Cook. Mrs. Ertle is up next. And Suzanne Bruce will be up after that. Good evening. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for honoring, um, as Ms. Cook said, just parental authority and making the decision 
you know, I, I respect you guys in the role that you're in, and I understand it is incredibly difficult to lead um, at such a time as this. Um, so thank you for making tough choices. Thank you for making mask optional. Um, I was recently at the basketball game at Lakota East, and I will tell you, it was just a breath of fresh air, right? If folks want to wear a mask, they had a mask on. We had kids there. They were smiling. And at the end of the day, that's what we need. And so I just want to encourage the community, um, you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. But at the end of the day, we've got bigger things in our district that are more pressing. And at this point in time, um, again, I tip my hat for keeping things optional and the parents making that choice. Um, we've got bigger fish to fry, so to speak, in the district. And um, I just want to encourage you guys. I know the seat that you're in is not easy, but I did want to say thank you for honoring parents. Um, I also want to just uh, voice a quick opinion in regards to the policy um, that is going to be discussed tonight in regards to curriculum. Um, I, I commend the direction. Um, I, I also think that there is a lot of truth to the fact that there really shouldn't just be one set of eyes on curriculum. Um, I don't think that's fair for Mr. Miller. I don't think it's fair for anyone to have that burden solely on their shoulders. So I think it's a, it's a great step for the district um, to allow the board to have more input in saying curriculum, to hear the concerns from the community, and, and at the end of the day, it'd be a, a joint decision. Um, I would also like to encourage, you know, if the opportunity arises, that it involves community input. Um, and I think it's a way to bridge the gap. I think there's a lot of concerns on both sides, um, both valid, both voices deserve to be heard. Um, but I think collectively, we can do that together and um, make the best decision for our kids. So thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Arnold. Mrs. Bruce. And our final speaker for the night is Regina McCall. For the first part. For the first part. Go ahead. Hi, um, Suzanne Bruce. I just wanted to say that I don't feel adopting this resolution would be wise for Lakota. Um, I feel like the health department does have the final say when it comes to restaurants, when it comes to businesses, when it comes to different facilities. I think that this resolution would be opening Lakota up to other lawsuits, um, maybe fines, maybe closing the schools. And our best interest is, is to do everything we can to keep the schools open. Um, I feel like if this resolution is the direction the board would like to take, maybe start attending the um, Butler County uh, Board of Health meetings. I think they're the third Thursday at the fairgrounds. Um, consider working with the Butler County Board of Health to maybe work on some of the, um, the concerns that um, as a board you may have that you're seeking in this resolution. So that's all I wanna say, thank you. And who day? <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Bruce, and appreciate that loyalty to our Bengals. Mrs. McCall, you're up. First of all, I'll say hello to everyone. Um, I didn't realize I signed up to speak, but I do have something to say. But um, <laughs> <laughs> since you did, <laughs> um, as far as mask, I do um, think that we need to follow the guidance and the science. I know there's a lot of opinions on both sides of that, but as someone who's a healthcare worker, who also works in the school, who also works with children, there's, there's a lot more than just the mask or not wearing the mask. While I know everyone has their opinion, I don't wanna bring up every, there is a lot more to consider because a lot, of a lot of people are impacted. As far as the curriculum, the changes concern me because I look at a district and the district is so diverse and so big. The teachers take all of that, everything into consideration when they're doing curriculum. When you're looking at curriculum or you have people overseeing that curriculum and they have their own personal biases or opinions or beliefs or considerations, you've taken that curriculum that's supposed to be broad enough to cover everybody and narrowed it down to those people who are involved. So when you start looking at curriculum as to everybody wants their hand on it, that causes more problems because the, pro the reason teachers are teaching is because they have the ability to look at the curriculum to cover everybody. While I know parents wanna be involved as a parent, I, I have a lot of concerns about that because that actually impacts the kids more than you could ever believe because they're not going to have that ability to grow as people because that curriculum and the world around them that's supposed to be open to everything as far as at school and what's appropriate has been narrowed down to be 
what the people who are controlling the curriculum wants it to be. While that may not be a concern for everybody, that's a concern for me. I feel like if that's something you want it to narrow it down that much, there may have, that, that may not be an option as far as public school. That's the beauty of public schools. This district is huge. It is very diverse. It have teachers from all different backgrounds. It have, uh, we have um, students from all different backgrounds and we need to be considerate of everybody and all the backgrounds. And the teachers really look at that to make everyone feel included, important and loved. And when you start modifying that curriculum to only include those who are controlling, for those who can, to can control the curriculum, you have locked out a lot of kids who, probably don't feel like they fit in anywhere else but besides school. My last concern is that, you know, as someone who works in education, if you look around the country, when you start putting restrictions on curriculum, it impacts the teacher's retention. It's going to impact property value. I don't have those facts, and I wish I had brought them with me because I looked them up, but it's bigger than just curriculum. It affects our whole community financially, academically, and everything else. Thank you. Thank you very much. I know that we have one more speaker, but we have reached, we're a little bit over our 30 minutes. So Mrs. Hajaji, we will have you come up at the first of the next public comment section. Okay, thank you. We'll move to board updates. Julie Butler Tech. Are we not responding? We're not responding to I'm any sorry. Questions. I guess I should say something. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I apologize, I was jumping right into the business. Uh, several great comments tonight. I appreciate uh, the diversity of thought in the audience. Mrs. Grindler spoke about the resolution and concerns that she has with it. Mrs. Richardson also spoke about the resolutions and concerns that she has with that and um, making sure that we're using factual and independent judgment. She did ask a question about how much have been spent on legal fees. Would one of you get back to her on that, please? Okay. Mr. Plasted voiced a concern about reverting back to protocols from 2020 being unsafe and also voiced a concern about House Bill 290. And this is Regla, Regla Haman, and I'm sorry if I mispronounced that name, um, voiced a concern about the curriculum policy that's on for first read tonight. And we will be talking further about those policies. So rather than address specific comments right now, we'll have board discussion. I think some of that will become a little more evident once we have that discussion. Uh, I can say that individual board members would not be approving curriculum though. That is a board decision, not an, on individual board members. Mr. Jesse voiced several concerns. Uh, one about 169.01 and our work sessions included. Work sessions are regular meetings. They are, and they, we do have a, a public participation comment section in our work session as well. Just one. Uh, question around how does curriculum get approved? Matt, do you want to address that? Sorry. There you go. We do have board policy on that, on how it's approved. So I, can, I don't have the number in front of me, but I can certainly get that. Would you speak to Mr. Jesse about that? Sure. Okay. Uh, he did ask a I'll question. I'll bring it up at the next meeting too, because I think there's a lot of questions about that, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, he did ask a question that I think is a great question about in the public um, participation would the ADA, would it be compliant with an ADA and those with disabilities needing to speak at meetings? I think that's a good question to review. A good question. And I think we would make accommodations for somebody that needed some assistance. Okay. And there's a question on when is the final agenda posted? Um, the final agenda can be posted right up until the meeting actually happens. And if there are changes to the agenda that are proposed at the meeting, then the board would vote on amending the agenda to include those. Anything else on that, Jenny or Matt? Mrs. Bredestage brought up um, the Zoom policy about participating in meetings. Does someone want to address that or is that still under consideration? Our, when we changed the board policy, that 
was an option and I remember us discussing it, but I also remember when we went away from that, some of the concerns that were brought up was our policy says that um, you need to be a resident now. There's no way to check who those who who you are on Zoom. You can type in any name you want. <laughs> um, and also sign up sheet. We you have a process by which you sign up to speak during that. And so how would you try to um, flush both of those together. So we did move away from that. Um, it is not in the draft tonight, but it's a first read. And so if you'd want to look at that again, you could. So it sounds like that's a question of logistics and practically making that work well. So well, we have that policy already on for discussion. So that can be something that we discuss. Um, Mr. Kruger raised some concerns about masking for kids and not allowing kids to have an identity. And he referenced his ninth grade grandson and it was difficult to pick him out of a picture. We also have Diane Curtis talked about um, Super Bowl and what we all witnessed there in terms of adults being unmasked while kids were still being required to be masked. And Mrs. Cook talked about mutual respect and recognizing that there are strong feelings on all sides of these issues and appreciate the, um, the point you made, Mrs. Cook, about mutual respect. Mrs. Ertl uh, said a thank you to the board for honoring parental authority and having masks be optional for the past several months. Mrs. Bruce uh, voiced concerns with the resolution and stated for a preference for not adopting that and suggested attending some Butler County Health Department meetings to weigh in on issues that people might have with it. And Mrs. McCall, healthcare worker, talked about masking as well and concerns about that and also expressed a good deal of concern about the policy on curriculum and making sure that our curriculum is inclusive for all of our students. So thank you all, those were great comments. Are there any, any other feedback board, Matt and Jenny? I'll, I'll save it for superintendent's update on a couple of things related to COVID and masking and things. Okay. Anything else or shall we move on? Just one clarification for Jenny on a special meeting. Our committee meetings would not be considered special meetings for purposes of public comment. So just want to clarify that as my, I know yeah. that was my question to you. So. That's, a, that's a good clarification. That is correct. Committee meetings are not special board meetings. So only special meetings and regular meetings, which include work sessions would include that. But policy, um, well, are all board committee um, committees, those are still committee meetings, which would include facilities, diversity, um, diversity and, safety. and safety, do not include um, public comment either. So in case everyone couldn't hear that, but uh, committee meetings are, we are very appreciative of having the community there, but they're not participatory. It's there as an observer, observation. right? For observation. Anything else, board? All right. Now we'll move on to our board updates. Julie, Butler Tech. Uh, yes. Sorry. The student success newsletter we always hand out uh, for November or for November for January is here. Um, we did have our last meeting right after. Um, our last Butler Tech meeting right after our, our Lakota board meeting. So I kind of previewed some of the things that I knew were gonna be on that agenda at our last meeting. So uh, just to kind of summarize, we talked a little bit about enrollment at Butler Tech. It did turn out to be that they closed uh, enrollment January 31st. They did, as we've discussed, get rid of the interview process that they used to have at Butler Tech because of a change um, of a ruling that said that Basically, you had to disprove bias in your interview process. So if somebody accused you of having a bias in that interview process, you had to prove that it wasn't a biased interview process. And the thought is that that's pretty challenging to how can you, 
you can't prove that you didn't discriminate against someone in, in that interview. So therefore they eliminated the interviews um, for Butler Tech. The enrollment uh, numbers turned out to be about 2,200 students for 1,500 spots. So about a third of the students had to be turned away. Um, we did have a legislative visit this week, uh, or last week, I'm sorry, up in Columbus. We met with Senator Blessing, Representative uh, Carruthers, Representative Gross, Representative Hall, and Representative Creech. A lot of our discussions centered around with the Cup Patterson funding bill, that that was to have to be a blueprint for six years. But now we're hearing that perhaps it will not continue in its current form. And how, if you think about that from a business perspective, how can a school effectively operate when they don't know what their funding sources are going to be more than two years at a time? Uh, we talked about that with career tech, there's major investments that are needed when you're opening a new lab or doing a new program. And would anybody be willing to make that investment if they didn't know if they were gonna have to, the funding to continue that investment after two years, it's not a prudent financial decision. And it's really limiting, or limiting our ability to serve enough of our students. Whereas if we knew what the funding model would be, there would be a lot more ability to expand. And in addition, Butler Tech is still currently on a uh, cap. And so we're also struggling because of that to expand and meet the needs of students. We did make a change. Again, I mentioned it last time that they were looking into adding an additional welding lab. They were able, they're planning on doing that, but they're having to sunset another program in order to do that. So it's an auto mechanic program that will be um, eliminated because there wasn't as much demand, although there were students who are still involved in that program. So it's unfortunate that in order to meet some students' needs, we're unfortunately going to have to sunset a different program. Um, I will continue to be the legislative rep for Butler Tech. Um, so I look forward to, there will be another um, lobbying trip in a career tech legislative conference in March that I will be attending as well. So we'll continue to work at the federal level as well as at the local level on making positive changes. And that's about it. And we have another meeting tomorrow, so. Any questions for Mrs. Schaefer? What are what what is needed to provide funding for Butler Tech? More funding uh, from the from Butler County. Well, right now, I mean, right now we are waiting on the one the expansion program that they were trying to get ESSER money from um, the the commissioners. So that was another point of discussion that a couple of the legislators said that they would have further discussions on that. So that would be one piece. Um, but again, it's it comes down to stable funding without caps is what's needed. Yeah. Do you think it would be beneficial for the board to um, write a letter to the commissioners um, in support of ESSER dollars? Um, we certainly could do that, or I think if individual people are willing to have those conversations, that that would be beneficial as well. Um, but again, that was those dollars were going to be used more for facility uh, growth and modifications, whereas we it needs to coincide with the funding to implement those programs as well. So it's really kind of a two tiered piece. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? We'll move on to the policy committee, Mr. Vogelman. The uh, policy committee did meet on Friday, February 11th. Um, one thing I want to explain, first of all, just so everyone kind of understands, first read. Um, this is basically what we do after we have our policy meeting for the board to see the edits that have taken place. It does not mean that those are set in stone, that that is what is happening. Then the board has time between this meeting and the next official meeting to ask questions, possibly look at maybe some word changes uh, before it goes up for a second read, which would then be the time that the board would vote on that policy to be enacted and become active. So this is just the first read of kind of, here's the edits that came forward. 
and then the board can have discussion on whether they want to keep those edits or if they uh, want more clarifications. Um, and so during our meeting, we did have three policies that came up for review um, as they are listed there in first read on the agenda, 0169.1 public participation, 2210 curriculum development, and 8450.01 protective face coverings. Um, one thing that we may want to consider for the board to do, I've, I've been kind of helping kind of bring things together as far as uh, working with the board and scheduling the meetings and trying to take the edits and working with Neola, who's our policy provider, working with our administrators uh, when they have edits as well and try and pull it all together. Uh, for the first time in uh, eight years since I've been doing this, we had some edits actually come from board members that weren't on the committee. And I think during our committee time, we had some some struggle to try and understand maybe what some of the words meant. And so we may want to talk about a workflow on how it goes through the committee members uh, so that they have a better understanding so that there can be a better conversation at that meeting so that when we come here, uh, as you mentioned earlier, there'll be some conversation about some of those questions here. Uh, haven't had it before, which is great. That means you're getting more people involved in policy and more people caring about what, what is actually out there as referenced tonight by the public comments. Uh, and so just something something to consider for the board uh, to think about moving forward, maybe a workflow of, of how the committee members can can have those policies in advance of meetings so there can be a, a better conversation so we can have clarifications ourselves, because there were there were a couple points in the committee where we kind of looked at each other and tried to guess what what some of those edits may have meant. And, and they'll they'll share that with you here in a little bit too. Uh, but zero one six nine point one, just making changes to public participation, trying to expand uh, those opportunities. Uh, and make sure that we are including the right people who can participate uh, in public participation and some clarific, clarifying language throughout there. Uh, 2210 with the curriculum development, talking about able to review. Uh, there was some mention talking about if there are concerns with curriculum, there is a, as one of the public comment mentioned, there is policy 9130 that talks about public complaints. And in that public complaint, there is there's a section in there that kind of outlines what to do if you have questions or you're concerned about materials. Uh, and so maybe that might be something to consider. Uh, and then 8450-01, uh, uh, we really weren't sure on what to do with this one, uh, but I know that's something that has happened since our meeting time, uh, seeking clarification uh, on what our legal things are, or what we can and can't say. And I believe that came back after our meeting and that's why it's on here. Um, but what I'll do is I'll open it up to our two committee members over there and they can expound because I know each one of them have some concerns on a couple of things. And during our committee meeting, we said it's probably, probably good for board discussion to take place on some of those clarifying questions. So I'll, I'll turn it over to our committee members. Thank you. So Darby and I serve on the committee. And so another piece is that if Darby and I and our committee meeting are not in agreement, then that discussion needs to go to the whole board. Um, so again, some of the wording that was here, even though it's still here, we didn't necessarily come to consensus on what it should say. So then that needs to be discussed and come to consensus with the entire board um, versus just Darby and I. Shall we take these as they appear on the agenda? Sure. Public participation for 0169.1. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things we discussed under I guess it's B, um, is in addition to the proposed wording that is stated there, um, making sure that we added parent or legal guardian as well as someone who could speak, um, because Darby brought up the point that what if you, one parent lives here and one lives in Fairfield, we would both want them to be able to weigh in on their child's education and uh, speak to us. So that is a modification from what was proposed um, by Mrs. O'Connor that we were hoping to add um, in in this document. So these proposals came from Mr. D and I just so that you're aware. Okay. Um, also, I think we wanted to work on the on the wording um, and shift. Um, on part E, it said participants must first be recognized by the presiding officer and will request to preface their comments by announcement of their name, period. Instead of adding their address may be provided as a preface. I think we could shift that up to um, just that when they, when they register to put their address and that's all that's needed. 
So the goal of that was so that people had expressed concern about expressing their address at the microphone. And so we're in agreement on that. That's fine. I okay. think the registration with the writing in written form is fine. That right. does away with that concern about privacy. Yep. So on C, we would add address will be on registration as an addendum to C in order to capture that. Um, and then instead of having that under that component. So, and just basically we're deleting that last sentence because we've already covered it in prior That's fine. bullet points. Uh, the other one that I would like to um, discuss is adding a designee. Um, I feel like at the time when we need it the most, this policy is restrictive if we do not add designee. Um, it restricts the district ability to hear people who care enough to come and speak um, speak with their own knowledge. And I was not in agreement with that. We've historically only allowed those who, um, now we've added the parent designation. We hadn't captured that before. And residents and business owners who have a vested interest locally, I am concerned that if we open it up to any designee, it'll become more politically charged and less those who have a vested interest in our district and those folks who may want to weigh in on something still have the ability to get in touch with us via email or some other means but i don't think that they need to take up the opportunity for our residents and business owners and parents to be able to speak during our designated time for public comment and on top of that i i again say this is not the time to restrict comment what happened to transparency when you want to restrict you want to rest, we want to restrict who can speak, and I don't think that is supported by the community. Um, and and you know they want to hear from everyone. I, think, I don't think we can say that. I think at this point we only have thirty minutes, and for me, I would hate to lose letting somebody that is outside of our district or does not have a child in the district or a business owner to take up the time of somebody, a resident or a a parent or a resident that wants to address the board you could you could come to a point where again things are so politically charged across the country that you could come to a point where in the 30 minute period depending on how we do sign ins or when people arrive that your entire 30 minutes could be spent on people who do not live or reside or have business in our district I would not be in favor of that. Okay, uh, my own um, observation and point on this is uh, we would like this, uh, the first 30 minutes to be on the agenda item. That is the only time we have time slot for it, which is limited to 30 minutes. But the second uh, public uh, participation should be left open because I don't want this, we uh, personally, I don't want somebody to come here with something that they want to express to the board. And because we limit them and we have time limitation, they went back with whatever they wanted to say. So for the second uh, reading, I mean, second participation, we should leave it open three minutes, but we must make sure we hear every comment and every concern. Mr. D, let me clarify. If I was going ahead. <laughs> so you would like the second, I think we're talking possibly about two different things. You would like the second public comment yes. to not be limited to 30 minutes. Yes. But you still believe or do not that it should be a parent or business owner or resident. Okay. You're on that, I was going to go to that. That's my next point. I did a, a little research. And since this is the first reading, I'm going to try to see if I can get that clarified. That it should be open to anybody because it's, it's called uh, public participation. You must not be resident in the school district. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong, but I'm going to get that clarified. And since this is the first reading, I can get that up next minute, next minute before we vote. But public participation should be, to, this, particularly the second part, should be open to everybody. So <clears throat> I would actually agree with Mr. D in terms of I would be willing to ex extend the time frame to make sure that everyone is heard. 
However, I do think that those with a vested interest in our district should be the ones that are speaking. And I would not, and, and actually we did not put designee into that uh, policy with one exception. And Mr. Jesse actually referenced this, but I had, had come to this conclusion as well. I do not have an issue with allowing for a designee in the case of special circumstances. And that is why I included, by the way, I know we'll get to it in a moment, but that is why I included um, number five about waiving the rules so that we have that opportunity when we need to with special circumstances. So in a sense that is a designee, but I wanna be sure that we are accessible and perhaps that's an issue you can go back in the committee and clarify that a little bit more, but otherwise I would not allow someone from outside the district other than our parents of currently enrolled students. Um, that'll be an interesting conversation for you to continue then in, in committee. You wanna to move to G? Does that address that question? Yeah, I'm wondering if we add, I'm trying to look up where in the policy it speaks to, um, I who can speak and then uh, where it says, well, I guess we don't specify it yet. Uh, no designee, maybe add unless required via ADA compliance or something along that line to even spell it out more clearly, even though I know we do have five as kind of that catch all, mm -hmm. but to explicitly state. Um, I can probably get some words. Yeah, designees would be yeah, from one acceptable. Of our terms. And, and I, I also want to point out that the board at any time has the opportunity to invite anyone to come and speak to the board as an expert, or, and we have done that before. Uh, to come and speak in our public meetings if we so desire to do that. So the door is not closed to outside perspectives, but it would be a board decision to do that. Well, I think this is opposite of transparency and is censoring voices and censorship for the community. So this goes back to policy then to do, to consider the board's input, I would say, to the end. And it sounds like Mr. D would like to um, look yeah, into it further he, and perhaps you could get back to policy. Yeah, I'm gonna get uh, more details and I'm gonna forward it to the committee. Okay. Is there, is, there, is there something we can, I know you would like for the second public comment to be anyone that wants to speak. Um, are we on G now? Oh, I'm sorry, are we not on G? I, I think we didn't let them talk yet, but let's give them yeah, that's fine. Sorry. That's fine. Go ahead. I think we're moving to G. We're moving on to G? No, go, go ahead. G. No, no, you're good. I thought we were. <laughs> there are a lot of red things. <laughs> Can I move to G then? Yes. Okay, so speaking, the second public comment being everybody who wants to speak, would there be no time limit, no ending of the meeting? I mean, we use... I, I mean, I'm from back in the day, we had meetings till 1130 at night because mm -hmm. we did require it. And the way that Policy said, I, I just I feel like the way that the, the political climate, the nation, whatever you would like to call it is, if we don't have some sort of ending, we have, I don't know. I mean, Matt and Jenny have been here since eight o'clock this morning. Yeah. Let I just feel like it's not a good use of anybody's time to go. If you want to say 45 minutes instead of 30 or enter for it, an hour time, you know, like 930, whatever you want to put in. I just think if you leave it open ended, it could not be beneficial. Can I speak to that? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is my personal observation and my opinion. Um, we can still regulate and, and advise our speakers. If you know that somebody has speaking on a topic, you don't have to repeat it. But what I'm, my own on the, uh, 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 perspective is somebody waiting for a board meeting and the day of the board meeting, he or she is limited from speaking because put a time on it. If anybody comes in and has something to say, the person should be able to speak, at least for the second uh, agenda, uh, public participation. That is what I'm trying to Mr. say. Mr. Adi, what do you think about setting a 1030 or something along those lines? It could always be altered by the Possibly. board agreeing to that by a vote. Yes. 
would you be willing if, to consider yes, that? Yes, I can consider that. Like if we put and it, I would consider that how long we can wait, but but everybody should be able to speak. And I will just say one more thing, I mean, because it's got to go back to the committee, is that, again, this isn't the only opportunity that people have to reach out to the board. They don't have to wait till a board meeting, but I understand what you're saying. And you can put that, if you want to put that time limit on there back into committee and let them consider that, I will think about it. All right. <laughs> uh, and the purpose of G, by the way, uh, and I was in disagreement and voiced this when the last board changed it to no one could speak more than once. I am, if you're not comfortable with the same topic and rather not that's objective, I am comfortable if we take that entire line out. I don't think we should have people because we already restrict the first portion to comments only on the agenda. I don't think we should say people can only speak once. There may be something else they would like to comment on. And I would prefer to have agenda related items before we do our business. And then after that on any topic and the same people might wanna speak on something other than agenda. So I am fine if we take G out completely. Yeah, um, can, I, can I add something to that? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, saying, I'm saying this because I remember one time uh, a parent had an issue that was very, very crucial to her child and she was cut off because the time is, is up. She spoke for three minutes, but she still have more to say. In my opinion, such a person can come back the second time if we have enough time allocated for them to finish whatever they wanted to tell us, because it was very crucial to her. I know she cried and she left this place in pain. <laughs> and that is my reason why I think we should be able to give ample time for people to air their views and their concerns. The, the challenge is some districts have gotten in trouble because there is the opinion that certain views are being cut off and other views are being allowed to continue. And so if you give everyone a different amount of time and you don't adhere to your policies, it can become an, a legal issue. There was a local district that got in trouble for that. So but I also think there's something for compassion. And when a, when a mother is up in front tearing, tearing up because of her experience, I think we could have offered her a little bit more compassion and let her finish. So let's- It's let's easy to back. say that when you're not sitting in the seat, Mrs. Bodie, just mm -hmm. an FYI. I appreciate that there are strong feelings, but let's not applaud, let's not please. Applaud. Yeah. Um, we have lots to talk about tonight. <laughs> Um, I, th I think probably that's sufficient on the, the examples, but I am comfortable if we take out that line completely and just allow people to speak more than once. That was my intent. I believe that was Mr. D's intent. Yes. So if you've already, yeah, if you've, if I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, see, I have a big enough mouth. He does not. You can hear me without the microphone. I'm going to use my teacher voice. No, I just, I just made the comment that we, we have time before the second read to work on some of those. It feels like we're committeeing again, which is okay, but it's not going to be final tonight. You're not voting on it. Right. I agree so some, some of us have to digest and go through right. it again. And I'm also going to roll out. You have a few committees right now that are all board members. And I know this is, and maybe it won't continue this way, but if you feel like you're getting to the point where the, po the policy committee can't be as productive as it needs to be, and it needs to be all five board members, then I would also say to you, you know, I know again, this is just the first one, but. Um, I'm throwing that question to you. Um, is it sufficient to continue the policy committee in the way that it is structured now? Is it going to be productive? So I'm just throwing that out as a question. I think we give it more than one meeting before we make that determination. But the, these, Mr. Vogelman's comment about, um, well, in the fact that I, I would disagree with the fact that board members who are not in the policy committee have not sent policies in previously, because I've certainly done that. 
And I am perfectly fine with being on speed dial during the committee meeting. If you all need me to be on speed dial and you need to answer the questions or whatever, however we need to make that work. Was there anything else on 169? Yes, I would like more clarification on K5. So it says the presiding officer may waive these rules with the approval of the board when necessary for the protection of privacy or the administration of the board's business. Can you just give more clarification on what you meant by that? So what we meant by that was actually for whoever the presiding officer is to have a mechanism by which you can end discussion on things that perhaps are not meant for public discussion, whether it's talking about a minor or someone bringing up a staff member's name. We don't talk about those issues in public discussion. Um, if someone went into uh, negotiations, when we're in the process of negotiations, but some way to say, you know what, we're going to stop this comment right here. That would be a waiving of these rules. So it's a mechanism. Um, and the other piece was the one I had already mentioned previously, which was allowing for a designee, someone with disabilities, accommodations or whatever, because at, this, at the point that I was writing those notes out, it wasn't included in there. That's what I intended. So the designee portion is just to stick with someone who might, like Mr. Jesse said, someone who might need. Or a parent with a child or right. some of, right. Something that we need to take into account the individual situation without coming back for a board vote on every single te technicality. So just to facilitate the process of the meeting. And then I think we'd already talked about the final piece uh, and certainly the committee's open to have more discussion as Mrs. Logan talked about participation on Zoom meetings. And there's actually, it's my understanding, there's legislation that's pending that's been partially approved to, uh, because right now been approved. a board member cannot. It has been approved to go request. through June of 20, it, June. It's just sitting on the governor's desk. Right. Right. It's waiting so for a signature. Not, yeah. So that unfinished thought was that there has been legislation that uh, will allow board members or elect locally elected officials to participate by Zoom still through this fiscal year. June 20. Mm -hmm. And does that play a role is your question? Uh, it, I'm just saying that there has been a change in legislation. So I think that that was part of why it's my understanding that this got removed because of the change in legislation. And now it is more permissive just so that people are aware of that. Should I think the so logistical choose? piece is something that you all should talk about. All right. So again, we're talking about the things that we should talk about and the logistics, but we do not have another committee meeting before we would vote on this, correct? Our next is, March, yes. No, our March meeting is 28th okay. of March. Okay. So you would have another committee meeting. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Would you like to move to 2210? Oh, yes. Um, so this, the changes are somewhat minor, but their implications could be more significant. So first on, after the, there's a paragraph and then it says for, it defines what curriculum should be. So I just wanna make sure that everyone has read um, for purposes of this policy and consistent communication throughout the district, curriculum shall be defined as the courses of study, subjects, classes, and organized activities provided by the school learning B, learning activities approved by the board for individuals or groups of students and expressed in terms of specific instructional objectives or class periods, and C, the plan for learning necessary to accomplish the educational goals of the district. So as we discussed in committee, curriculum is very broad. So then the next modification to the policy at the bottom of that first page and onto the second says the two superintendent shall seek board approval for curriculum. And then the second part of the modification was an individual board members request to view classroom specific materials should be submitted through the superintendent and should not be unduly onerous. So again, we had a disagreement difference of opinion um, of how this should be handled. I think I had concern more with the first half and um, Mrs. Bodie had concern with the second half of our modifications. Would you characterize that as accurate? Yes. <laughs> um, so I am concerned that 
what does it look like when we say the superintendent shall seek board approval for curriculum and how broad will that be? Um, I know that our classroom teachers continually modify what they're teaching to meet the needs of the students. I don't want this to become a situation where they're having to submit their curricular materials before the start of school for us to sign off on. So, and with that broad list, I think that leaves that very open to interpretation that concerns me. Um, so I personally would be more comfortable with something where it defines it perhaps as the course of study or the learning objectives or something that's more defined as to what we're approving then. So it's clear that we don't have an expectation that we're getting every teacher. I use the example in the meeting of every teacher at Hopewell's, you know, curriculum. So um, that concerns me. And I, I, we're, we're, we were going to have some discussion on the curricular review tonight, or is that? Yeah. So I feel like we have professionals that we've hired, and as uh, Kelly and I went to um, Board Leadership 201 training this weekend, and they kept talking about your superintendent is your instructional leader. Um, and I just have a concern that we don't bypass our professionals in the realm of curriculum, our superintendent, and those who have much more knowledge than we do about the curricular needs and modifications that need to be made. So, <laughs> and, and I feel right now there has been issues in the community with transparency and that it has been a concern and we are trying to address that um, with the board approval because we have not been in and as involved, not we per se, but I believe the board has not been involved in making decisions with the curriculum as we, as much as we could have. Um, it also says um, that the board of education shall have management and control over all public schools in the district um, on policy 122, supported by ORC 3313-47, ORC 3313-17, and ORC 3313-20. Um, it states that the Board of Education shall have management and control over all public records. The Board of Education of each school district shall be a body politic and cor corporate and as such capable of being sued and sued. So we are now liable for what is being taught in the school system. And then the Board of Education of a district or the governing Board of Educational Services shall make any rules that are necessary for its government and governing of its employees. So part C, um, PO 118 part C for the Board of Education has assigned specific authority throughout stature and board shall not relinquish or fail to exercise that authority. So as much as I, I do agree with this, it's already in the policies several times that we do have um, authority over the curriculum, but I'm okay with adding that. But I'm just stating we do have it several times in our policies, but my concern is um, going to going that the board individual members request to view classroom specific material should be submitted through the superintendent and should not be done or should not be unduly onerous. I think onerous and duly onerous is subjective to who, I mean, who is to say what is onerous that could um, go either way. And then also at this time, I think, again, we're limiting um, we're limiting, this policy is limiting access and is diminishing the board's responsibility and authority. We have a conflict with parents and an administration as to what is being taught. This is a trust issue and, it, and its resolve is evidentiary. You cannot put admin and control into looking into this matter. This is an attempt to restrict access to board members. We need to follow the law and take responsibility, authority, and reliability. Um, and then this matter is basically a trust because the parents see a, a trust issue. The parents see critical race theory and divisive um, things in the school that they are concerned about. And we're basically putting Matt as the gatekeeper. And that's his job. <laughs> Sorry. Please let her finish. Yeah. 
sorry, but again, this is limiting access. And I think to do our job appropriately, we need to be able to um, openly see the curriculum without going through that or, or an assignment. So, and again, um, Mrs. Bodie brought up some other policies. We already in conflict resolution policy, uh, public complaints and dispute resolution, excuse me, um, policy 9130 have a process in regarding, it says matters regarding material used in district programming. And if somebody has a concern, there is a process that's spelled out. And as we found in other situations, my concern is if you bring the board in upfront, then we cannot be objective arbitrators in the back end. Should a complaint go through the dispute resolution and we've been involved up front versus allowing it to go through what's in 9130 as the appropriate process, um, we're bringing ourselves in at the incorrect time. So that is, since we already have how it should be handled um, with dispute resolution, I would prefer to follow that process um, and not interject ourselves too early. So we cannot be objective in the end. Mrs. Casper, Mr. D, comments? Yeah, okay, mm -hmm. I have a, a comment on this. Uh, my comment is, first of all, the last time the curriculum uh, review or audit or development was done was December 1st, 2014. 16. Right? 16 was the last curriculum audit. 2016? Okay. I apologize. 2016. And I believe that from there, from then to now, there has been a lot of uh, concern that has been expressed. Um, I believe that this review is necessary because there have been several questions and concerns as regards uh, the things that have been taught in the class. And um, it is time for us to have this audit to make sure we clear the air that the teachers are teaching exactly what is in the curriculum and nothing outside what is in the curriculum. And that is why I, uh, I believe that it's time to do that. Then on the area of uh, here that says an individual board member's request to review classroom specific materials should be submitted through the superintendent and should not be unduly, uh, unduly one of us. I believe that there's organizational hierarchy. Mm. I believe that my job is to make sure that the superintendent and the treasurer are doing what they're supposed to do. Even as much as I want to know what is in the class, if there's any concern, of course, I'm going to hold uh, the superintendent and the treasurer responsible. So I believe I would trust you enough to handle any concern that comes from the classroom. So I believe that should should stand. That's my personal opinion on that. So board approval, yes. Yes, and board approval, yes. Go to the superintendent, But yes. everything goes through the superintendent. And that's where I believe it should be done because that should be, if we do not stick to a policy, we will, I mean, I, mean, I believe that some teachers seeing me or seeing my colleagues in the class sometimes they can be nervous. They could be wondering why you're there. And it's possible to, whatever you want to find, you might not be able to say. So that's what I think should be done. Mrs. Casper. Um, uh, collect my thoughts. I've had all this time to collect my thoughts. <laughs> Everybody else was speaking. We, I don't believe that any parent any parent can go to any teacher at any time and ask to see assignments or curriculum or books or whatever they want. I don't believe we ever deny a parent anything like that. I know that Mr. Coney has spent a lot of time talking to parents that have concerns. I feel like us having to approve every piece of curriculum, every lesson plan, every documentation is stifling our teachers to teach the way that they should to engage each student. I think that having to take it 
lesson plan from every teacher at every minute is something that is out of our realm of responsibility. I don't have a problem with, and unless Mr. Miller has a problem being the curriculum gatekeeper, that is what he is hired to do. And if there is an issue, there are many avenues to correct that issue. We know we've seen them, we've, it's happened. The, the, my concern with a parent going to a board member and the same as Mrs. Schaefer and asking for a resolution, there's a chain of command to do that. And now we've sullied that chain of command because we know this, a, any one of us would now have more information than the other one. So I, I just don't think that that's where we need to be involved. Yes, we approve curriculum. And again, I think defining curriculum is important. We really probably should change that part to define what we believe curriculum is. I just don't, we are already losing teachers. We know that in the profession, in the country, not just here. And I think like Mr. D said, if you have a board member walking into a classroom and asking for a lesson plan without having any, the teacher having any knowledge that we're coming, I, I just don't, that's not right. I mean, I was a teacher. I, you teach based on the state standards and the curriculum and what's happening today in that classroom. Because you walk in there, I promise you that I had a month's worth of lesson plans every single month submitted. And every day I had to tweak those a little bit because of whatever, because of the, it's snowing outside and there's a two hour delay. So now I've got to figure out how to cram that all in. I don't, it seems to me that this putting these things in policy means we don't trust our staff. Hmm. We don't trust our teachers. We don't trust our administrators. We don't trust Mr. Miller and Mr. Coney to do their jobs. Am I saying carte blanche, let everybody do what they want and we never review it? No, I'm saying you have to have faith and trust in the people that we've hired. Go ahead. I would also like to say um, to what you just said that this past year, two years, we have basically realized that some of us parents cannot trust what is being taught. Not that it's to the, to, I'm not saying that there are bad teachers. I'm just saying what some of these teachers are teaching needs to be a little bit more underneath a microscope and we are concerned. And so I agree that we probably should narrow it down. Like I would like to add online resources to be approved and TV channels in, in um, classrooms that are being watched. Um, and there's more, more that we can dive into. So I, I will agree that we need to revisit what specifically maybe we're talking about, but we need transparency. We need to see what's going on in the classroom and we are not seeing that. And so that is why we are concerned, you know, about the curriculum and need more transparency. Uh, Can I say something? May I jump in? You may. Okay. Thank you. Did you have something else, Mr. Yes. Give me a moment since okay. I haven't spoken yet. Oh, yeah, sure. So if that's all right. And my turn. <laughs> she gets to jump in. And then we'll do one more round and we're going to move on. How's that? This is again right. a first read. So um, let me start first with, we need to remember, I think, when we look at this, that policy sets direction from the board. The superintendent then develops, or the treasurer, then develops the process by which it will be implemented. So in my mind, in uh, suggesting this policy change, I expect that the direction is given to Matt and that Matt as the superintendent develops that process for how that curriculum approval process happens. I am not thinking about, we through uh, weeds on doing that. That's no, not our job. No. So let me clarify that not right there is that's going to be up to Matt to come back and say, okay, we're going to look at doing it this way. Does this work? Secondly, we talked about 9130, which I think is terrific. We do have a complaint process for dealing with all kinds of things. Certainly curriculum materials are included in there. Suggesting though that 9130 be the, be the replacement for this to me is not how it works best. I think that this policy works in conjunction with 9130. 9130 is reactive, something's already happened, there's a parent concern, there's a student issue that's happened. In this particular case, we would be 
proactive instead, looking at are there concerns with whatever it is. And again, we don't know what that process will look like yet. But I think it has to be proactive. And if there are issues, we also have reactive. So I see it working together. And then the final piece, when we're talking about language and whether or not we include it in our policy or not, we do have Ohio Revised Code language that is very, very instructive. And this is 3313.60 prescribed curriculum. And frankly, we could put exactly this in here instead. I was trying to simplify it, but the Board of Education of each city, exempted village and local school district, and the Board of each cooperative education school district established pursuant to section 3311.521 of the Revised Code shall prescribe a curriculum for all schools under its control, straight out of Ohio Revised Code. And then um, towards your point, Mrs. Schaefer, which I think was a great question about the purposes of this policy, it's the second paragraph down. I agree with the A through C, but I also believe these pieces should probably be added to that, again, straight out of Ohio Revised Code. Survey or questionnaires, textbooks, workbooks, software, video, other instructional materials being used by the district. And it's not that I want to see all of those pieces, but they should be accessible to our board should the case arise. I don't wanna go into every classroom, that's not our role. So let me talk about that secondly. The piece about, um, sorry, no, I don't, too many papers up here. The piece about the individual, individual board members request to view classroom specific materials. I don't see this as a matter of trust in our teachers or staff, I think they do a terrific job. And I know that they're working hard to pull it together every single day to reach every student in their class. That's a given for me. I also think that it could be very, very disruptive to the educational process. What's going on in that classroom? If we go into buildings, he's responsible for what's happening in those buildings and is accountable back to us. And if he's not aware that we're doing those visits, he's getting phone calls from teachers or principals or staff. And what response does he have if he hasn't even been made aware that a board member is going to be there? I do believe that in conjunction and consultation with the superintendent, we should have access to the classroom. I know that every one of us really enjoys going into the classroom and hope that our teachers would invite us more often to visit, but it's a visit that's planned. The other piece I think we have to consider evaluative issues are a part of our contracts and certainly don't want that to become an issue. <coughs> we have 17,000 students and there is no way for a district this size for five of us to understand everything that's happening in the classroom every day. Again, Matt's 100% accountable for what happens. Yep. So in terms of the piece about the individual board member, I would let that stand as well. So one more round on this issue, if we could, if anybody wants to respond or say anything further and let's move on because we still have a lot of business to on. So are you saying that you do, you want to stand the individual board member request review classroom specific materials should be submitted through the superintendent? You, yes. Yes, okay, sorry. Okay. Lots, um, my, lots going on. Isaac, anything further? Yeah, my comment on that is, um, Ms. Bodhi, I, I, f I feel your pain. I, I understand where you're coming from, um, trying to get to the classes and see what is being taught in the class. If it is possible, if it is okay, I would have said yes to that, but I think that is not our job as board members. Our board members to make sure that the curriculum is exactly what it is and it's approved. So I agree with you because I've had so many questions, I mean, concerns sent to me as well, to all of us, that some things are taught in class. I believe there are some teachers that are teaching things that are not in the curriculum. So that is a different ball game. If we get the review done and somebody else is acting outside the curriculum, then I think Mr. Miller, we have to take care of that. That's what I think. Again, I think, you know, this is that second half is limiting access to the school or to the assignments and I, I don't feel that this would be something that's very disruptive. It's not like this would be a situation day after day after day. But I think if someone brings up a concern to um, a board member per se, that we should be able to uh, um, contact the principal 
or possibly the teacher to find out more information about this assignment in question. And I feel like you're putting, again, you're putting Matt as the gatekeeper. And I feel like kind of, what is he trying to hide if he wants everything um, to go to him? And he doesn't yes. trust. Madam President. And he doesn't trust his teachers to allow this is buddy let's move on let's move on we're, when we start getting into personal comments we're not productive anymore so i think if everyone's in agreement and i also do want to say that um we've suggested a curriculum audit do you want to talk about that this would be an oh, appropriate moment yeah i was going to do that in my update but i can do it now okay um we are currently conducting a curriculum audit already with hamilton county esc um, for grades seven through 12, English and math. Um, in addition to that, um, I'm meeting and talking with some other uh, superintendents later this week that have done different types of audits that might help us K-12, social emotional learning type things that we do in our district, um, other parts of the curriculum aside from the English and math to kind of dovetail into what you're saying that we haven't had one since 2016. So those wheels are, are moving and Keith and his team have already started with the county ESC in terms of the audit through seven through 12 through those two subjects. So on the horizon for some of that, um, but I wanna to talk to some of my colleagues and peers that have done um, different types of curriculum audits, whether it's SEL or equity or anything like that um, and match it up to A, what we do and B, what our kids need. So. And we appreciate you being responsive to the concerns we brought yeah. to you from the community and Absolutely. understanding we need to address it in some way. And, and if I may, just on some of the curriculum items, you know, the Ohio Department of Education has a standards that must be taught. So this isn't a Lakota thing. Um, and I'm certainly not hiding anything now or before. And I take exception to you, your accusation about that. <clears throat> um, I've been very clear that when, when a board member has an issue, with a building, with a teacher, with a student issue, all of you in one way or another have contacted me, whether it's phone call, text, email, what have you, and we find things out, we check it out. Um, doesn't mean that you're gonna be happy with the decision or the parent's gonna be happy or even the teacher's gonna be happy for that matter, but it, it does come up. And when you talk about conflict between parents and administrations, that's the nature of the business. We are a people business, it's a relationship built business, and that's what we do. In terms of curriculum for our for our teaching staff and for our kids, this is not this is not uh, an, an exact science. Teaching is an art. If you are a kindergarten teacher and you have twenty seven students, your curriculum is going to change hour by hour, student by student, based on what that child needs. We don't hire robots; we hire people. And, and our teachers, we try to get the best of the best, and they do what they can. And if I'm a gatekeeper of anything. It's saying yes to teachers and helping them find ways to access what they need for their kids. It's not about some agenda on the left or on the right. It's about providing access for our teachers and giving our students opportunities. And that's what we strive for. We are certainly not perfect. And uh, I am blessed with a fantastic team that probably doesn't get enough credit for the stuff that they do. But when you're talking about, you're looking for a gotcha or a a needle in a haystack. Again, we are not perfect. And when things come up, we'll try to address it and try to fix it. And so I would encourage the board to keep doing that when they hear something or they see get stopped at Kroger's or at the games or what have you, let me know and we'll, we'll track it down. And another piece we discussed in our meeting was that part of having Mr. Miller involved in that process is he can look for trends and he can see if there's anything that he needs to address. Whereas if everything's a one-off and the other piece is we govern as a board, we don't govern as individuals and it could be misunderstood within our schools if individual board members start saying things to staff without the will of the board matching what is being stated and it could be misunderstood by staff right and we saw two kids tonight that got recognized for their accomplishment kudos to their teachers for making that happen to their parents and we have kids that do things like that every single day and we have not been focusing on that as a school district for the past year or two years we have not focused on that piece we're getting distracted 
uh, by noise. In, in fairness, uh, we have had parent complaints. We're being responsive to that with the curriculum audit. Let's Correct. make sure we know exactly what's happening. And we're, and we're never going to be done. We're never going to be done. I mean, there's always going to be something for us collectively to work on, whether it's curriculum, whether it's diversity initiatives, whether it's any of those things. So we're never going to get to a place where we rest on our laurels to, to Isaac's point before. We don't intend to shorten your to-do list, superintendent. Yeah, so. I, know, I, know. I have a question about the, the curriculum um, audit. If, if I could say one more thing, please. I do believe that we could do a better job of explaining 9130 mm -hmm. and making that more accessible and helping our parents, sure. those who are concerned about issues, you know, it's buried in our policy piece. So I think yeah. it should be however we decide to do it. Probably but I do good, think that we should bring yeah, this out more. It'd probably be a good um, way to streamline things would be that. The other thing is we have that yes. button on the website now that is sort of a catch off for some of those things that we could channel these things into. And, and I would like to see us push it more on social media. If you've got an issue, here's how you need to address it. And here's who you go through. I don't think it's necessarily an easy process, in fairness. No, but we're, we, can, we can work on streamlining it. I'm glad to hear that. So I'll expect, as part of this, if this policy goes through, Superintendent, that you would come back and give us some understanding of how this process will work. It's yep. also a good idea for us to do that when we're approached. To okay. fight individual to follow the policy. Right. But right. just to let people know that the policy is out there. Absolutely. Instead of trying to fix it ourselves from the beginning. I have okay. a question on the um on the audit for English and math mm -hmm. that is it is currently being mm -hmm. um audited in Hamilton County. Hamilton County ESC, correct. Um do you have a list of what is included in the audit and what specifically they are looking for? I'll be glad to get that for you. Mr. Coney and his team will get that to and me and I'll the get results that to you. As well. Yeah, but they're they're a little far off. Yeah. But how long do you think it will take till the audit is accomplished? I don't I don't want to hazard a guess. I can get that information and get that to you in one of my updates. And it's actually two different audits that we're referring to. There's an ongoing piece, but we're also talking about a more in-depth in the future. I would imagine within the next SEO. few months that would start. Yeah, I would hope certainly by the end of the school year. Are there other organizations that do audits? Um, there are. If you look at the ASCD website, there's some. Yeah. And then who, what made us decide on Hamilton County? Um, it's just a, so it's just a co-op of school districts like ours uh, that have been working with them to do the audit. And we have tapped into their expertise before and um, no knock on Butler County. It's just sort of what Hamilton County does since they're a little bit larger. I'm sorry. Hamilton we County ESC is Hamilton County Educational Service Center. So Sorry. we get okay. funds to use yeah. for different projects that they act as a consultant to school districts. Correct. With the board's indulgence, I'm going to move us to our next policy. 8450.01. And I'm just going to ask us to be cognizant that there is still a great deal left on the agenda. So Julie, do you want to kick that off? Well, this 8450, um, we actually in the policy committee had asked to table this and not have a first read this evening. Um, so we didn't get into a lot of specifics uh, conversation on this policy. Our concern was that it felt like it was contradictory um, at times with what would be happening. And so it's my understanding that after that meeting, it was asked to be brought forward by other members of the board, but we haven't had full conversation on this in our committee. Right, this was added last minute after we'd already put out the agenda and decided that we were going to have the two policies on there to discuss. Um, so I personally want to rescind that um, policy, and that's why I did not um, have any discussion because we need to rescind the mask mm -hmm. policy. And I did not desire to rescind it, but I felt that it was contradictory where at time we say here in the uh, modification at no time may the superintendent require any less for face coverings than may be required by law or local health departments. But then later on, uh, we say that if people want to not wear their mask for basically any other reason as one of the catch-alls that they don't have to, which concerned me that that contradicted 
saying what our local health department guidance is. Well, again, we all, most of us know, hopefully everyone who's watching knows, um, we are mask optional, except when it is recommended by the health department, such as when you're coming back off of COVID, you've been out for five days, you're coming back the next five days, um, we're asking people to mask. And so my concern is the way this was worded as a principal or an administrator or as a parent, I would find it confusing going, okay, they say they're gonna follow you know, the current standards, which are, I always forget what it's called, mask to stay, test to play. Um, but then later on we say, you don't really have to if you don't want to for any reason. So I found that very confusing. Um, as I read it. And there wasn't any clarification on, um, you typically let people know why you're changing a policy. And, the, and so I wanted to know why are you changing this policy? Um, the update doesn't really do anything. It has no teeth. Do you believe that masks work? Then if you do, why would you restrict their use? So you're restricting their use but you're basically saying that you think masks work, which is fine, but um, it's meaningless and misguiding to say you want to end masks and not say why you want to end them. It's kind of dishonest to tell the people why you're doing this. So why were you? Okay. I'm going to ask Mrs. Bodie that you refrain from the really we, judgmental words. I think yes. it's gonna be a more productive conversation. So I don't think dishonesty was intended by anyone at the <laughs> table. Diverse points of view are okay doesn't make yours dishonest, doesn't make ours dishonest. It's just different. Mr. Adi, did you have any? Yes, I have something to say with this. And I believe that if one is speaking, I don't think it's proper to say you or, or they. This is a ball. I think we're all working together for the interest of our students, uh, the community, and their parents. So we're trying to find a solution that we suit everybody because there are very diverse opinions out there. When I read this policy and the review that I, I believe I understand with this is mask right now is, is not mandatory in the, in the school district. It's, uh, it's, we're allowing parents to decide when whether to wear a mask or not to wear a mask. Because if you're going by science, you're going by experts, there has been so diverse uh, opinions on whether mask work or mask does not work. I'm sitting here because I know when I was trying to get this seat, I made a promise that I'm gonna be sitting here on behalf of 17,000 students and 1,100 staff or thereabout, that the issue of mask, since we have not been able to establish whether it works or not, my personal view does not matter. What matters is what the parents, the students and their doctors decide. So in my opinion, this is putting back <coughs> mask back to the parents and their students and their doctors. So masks cannot be mandated. Then the second thing that I also want to point out on this is, thanks to Mr. Miller, I know you took a lot of heat when you were announcing mask mandate and you took everything on behalf of the board. And I believe that the board delegated you to do that. One of the things I'm requesting here is we're pulling back that power from you because you took so much heat. The board should be taking heat over everything to do with the policy instead of just letting you take the heat. And with that, we're pulling back that authority or the, the delegation to you to, to mandate mask anytime. That ma anytime there's need for mask mandate, you should come back to this board to approve it. So that is what I believe is what this policy is driving us on. I know we did a lot of adjustments. Most places we say, instead of required, we say recommended. 
and the review was done and it went through to legal counsel. They came back. That is why the, that's the reason why we brought it back for the first reading for us to discuss it. Our legal counsel looked through it and said, yes, they agree with this. And that is why we brought it back for, for first reading. And I would say we are still Judging. giving with this policy, we are still giving the board permission to, add, to mask our students. This is not our job. We are an educational institution first. And I think we need to take ourselves out of these decisions and allow the Board of Health to make these decisions, not the school board. We are not doctors, as you said. So why are we making our children? Maybe I'm not clear enough. Can I, can I clear myself? Certainly. Yes. We are not saying that we're going to recommend mask. The board is not, right now, we're not saying we're either recommending mask or mandating mask or not mandating mask. What I'm saying is if there's need, for mask to be mandated, if that can ever come up, it should be the, the duty of the board to make that decision, not Mr. Miller as an individual. So we'll pull that back. So mask should be optional and should be left for parents to decide for their students. Thank that you, is Ms. my recommendation. Thank you, Mr. D. This is Casper. So, Again, I this is I agree that this is a little confusing. So what we are saying that at no time the superintendent require any less for face coverings than required by the law or the local health department. OK, and if the board, if there is to be a mass mandate, it needs to be board approval. I understand what you're saying, Mr. D, but Mr. Miller has to be involved in the discussion. I think it would, Okay. He, he can call he for emergency meeting. meeting. Like, just yes. like he did. Yes. Exactly. He can call okay. for emergency meeting. Um, the transportation piece, the, is that, oh, this is a, such a confusing. We did get, Mr. D say, legal uh, opinion over the weekend that we need to follow the transportation federal guidelines to mask on buses still, correct? Yes, okay. but it's not required in, in this document, is what they said. Okay, because it's the le it's the less than the face covering. That's why it's not. It's a very confusing policy to me. So let's clean this up <laughs> before we have to vote on it. If you'd started with the template, you would have been amazed by it. But... So I'm um, not on the policy. Anything else, Mrs. Casper? No. Mrs. Bodie. I do not want to be a part of this political ruse, and I will not attach my name to this policy. And needs to be rescinded. This is Schaefer. Anything else? Um, again, as I stated earlier, I, I just personally find it confusing because of how it says at one point we will follow no less than is required by law or the local health department. But then after that, it says that people can not wear masks basically if they don't want to, two paragraphs later. Um, and I personally feel like that's not my understanding of the current mass to stay, test to play orders, which have the weight of law is my understanding from what we've been told. So I just don't want our administrators to have to look at this and a parent says, well, here, you know, Johnny doesn't have to wear his mask because I don't want him to. And it says you don't have to for other reasons. And then our principal's going, yes, but Johnny just got of, of his COVID quarantine for the, where he was out for five days. And so he needs to wear his mask when I, he comes back. I mean, again, I look at my own personal situation. I tested again after five days. I was still positive. I still lived in my basement, but other people chose, aren't even getting tested. And by this, we're saying they could come back unmasked just because they want to do that and i worry that the risk that that puts us on um from a, a liability issue of not following the board of health's recommendations and then i also brought up which i don't believe we've gotten back yet if this puts us at risk with ada compliance and putting some of our children um at risk and an undue burden on their family which is preventing them from getting the education that they are entitled to um, so I don't believe we have any opinion on that portion of it, which it, I'd like to see. So so let me respond to a few, not respond, but let me weigh in on a few of these things. And then we are going to move along past our policy. So 
Mrs. Boney had asked a question about why did this even come forward? And in my perspective, and I believe in Mr. D's perspective, our original and current policy, including Mr. Miller make all these decisions was born out of an emergency situation. We were getting changing guidance. It seemed like every other day and there would have been no way on a practical level for us as a board to meet often enough to make those changes. We are no longer in an emergency situation. I think that there's a need to evolve our policies about public, public health and safety. I think the policy is the proper place for a successful framework for our procedures, our actions, and our measures that allow us to adjust back to normal operations and allowing for changes that, that may occur suddenly. We need to update where we're at. I agree with the premise that certain masks being worn by our students are ineffective. We've gone back and forth and you've got experts on all sides as we've talked about. Even the CDC says that it has to be a very particular kind of mask in order for it to be effective. And the CDC also talks about, going back to you, is it exemption also talks about the fact that there are some students, some individuals that can't wear a mask. So the thinking and the highlights to this policy are number one, our policy needed updating. We felt that the board should make a determination in the future for mask mandates, and this would ensure that. In terms of the student <coughs> exemption for mask, we had students that their parents had taken the time to apply for exemptions based on very specific circumstances to their students, whether it was a health issue, an emotional health issue, whatever that situation was, religion, that was up to that parent, that legal guardian to make that decision. And so they applied for an exemption. And then we tell our students, if you happen to sit next to the wrong person at lunch, I don't mean wrong person in the negative way, but the, a person that then tests positive, your exemption doesn't count for anything anymore. And the circumstances for giving that exemption did not change. That student was still in need of that exemption. And so I think it's really important and, and feel strongly about this, that we honor those exemptions across the board. Now, the only ex exception that we made here was for OHSAA, because we wanna be sure that our students would not be disqualified from competing. If they decide parents or students not to wear a mask, then that's a determination that they're making, but we did not include that was the exception to the mask exemption. Those two points were the most important points in this policy, board approval, if there were to ever be another mask mandate and the fact that mask exemptions would be honored through our entire facilities. Um, in times of the bus issue, as Mr. Adi said, the attorney said that's fine not to put that in there. And the other important piece um, I think to know We're not making a suggestion in any way, shape or form that we violate laws. We, we swear an oath to fulfill the laws and to honor the laws of our state. And that line, and at no time may the superintendent require any less for face coverings that may be required by law. Law is not the same thing necessarily as a mandate, but we do need to honor the laws that are in front of us. And to me, that allows Mr. Miller to say, I'm sorry, but the legislature has passed this in Ohio code and that's what we have to do. So I believe that states are intention very clearly that we will follow the laws of the state. Okay. So that was the thinking behind doing the policy in the first place and the fact that it is time to update and time to begin to move forward. Just can I, real quickly. Sure. Um, I, I understand the line about the law and, but Mrs. Logan, was it last week or DPC or something where sometimes it's not called the law, but you still have to, follow it and that would be the transportation. Can you no, say which is that a DPC? Which is an order. order. So there, there are some things that come down that carry the same legal requirements, but they might not be called a law. So and we do have a legal opinion which I'm not going to discuss here regarding the Butler County Health Department and Ohio Department of Health and all of that too. So Again, this has been approved by legal that everything in it is acceptable. So. I'm still unclear and I guess I'd still like further clarification of the current exemptions can just be a parent sign off. And so does that allowing those follow the letter of the law and the 
order to still comply with mass to stay. Again, the legal decision said that was acceptable. I guess I interpreted it perhaps differently than you did then, because I interpreted it that it was just, oh, sorry, it was just going to over supersede allowing the exemption for any reason, but maybe I misinterpreted it. So I guess I still need further clarification because I might have interpreted it differently than you did. And we can make sure everyone again receives all of the legal opinions. Yes, and I can I can again? reach back out to legal and because I think I know what you're both saying. Yeah, and I can reach back out and clarify this, what they said. Yes, yeah. this is just a first reading, I think. Yeah, first reading. We still need more clarification. If there's yeah. anything that needs to be adjusted. Can I ask for some clarification? Of real quick, real fast. Uh, Mrs. Bodie, just so I understand, um, when you're asking for, you want us to follow the health department, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Are you talking Butler County? Are you talking ODH? Yeah, they have the authority to mask our children, um, technically. You do not. We do not. We cannot tell a child that they need a mask. Oh. It should be up to the student or up to the family of that student. All I'm asking is, do you, you're, just so I understand, again, just so I understand, you're recommending that we follow ODH guidance? No. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm honest, I'm just, I'm just asking a question. That's, that's what I thought you said. Yeah. If they have to implement a law or an order that says we must follow, then we must follow. Okay. But they, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I thought guidance. you said earlier that you want that you thought we should follow ODH guidance. That's what I thought. I heard there you is said. a law, or an, sorry, I was not clear. If I no, I'm clear on that. If there, if it is a law that has been passed and they are trying to implement, or if it is an order, then okay. yes. But when it is a suggestion or recommendation, recommendation, then they are the ones that should have to. Um, I guess enforce enforce okay. that. I'm just asking. I was just yeah. asking for clarification on they, what you said. They should have to enforce that, but it is not. So why, my, I mean, I got address this in my resolution, and there's a whole lot I could say. Okay, on we'll this. get to that. We'll get but to that. I just think that we should rescind this okay. mask policy. All right, I'm going to move us along with the board's indulgence. Um, thank you, policy committee. God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to legislative. <laughs> Superintendent and treasurer. Um, the only one I wanted to mention, it's been kind of legislatively slow on some things. Um, I know that they're talking about the um, uh, property value complaint system and that, that's out there. The, the one that I thought was sort of applicable to all of us is uh, the state board is looking at um, the report cards again. And by the end of March, uh, they'll be instituting a five-star system which to me sounds like A through F under the Kasich <laughs> administration. Um, we can call it whatever we want, I guess. Um, but there won't be a school rating or district rating based on this academic year just because of everything, all things COVID. Um, so I just want to point that out. So I think by March 31st, there'll be um, firm uh, report card rules moving forward. So I guess they're getting back into the swing of things as well. That was it. Thank you, Matt. Jenny? Um, the only thing I wanted to follow up on, I know we've gotten quite a few emails and comments about the backpack bill, which is House Bill 290. Um, just kind of <laughs> wanted to talk about the status of that. So I did look um, the committee schedule for tomorrow, actually, with the finance committee, because that's the committee that it has been um, sent to uh, to review is the House Finance Committee. They have a meeting in the morning at 10 a.m. And this is the first hearing. It's just sponsor testimony. So it's just the two um, legislators who are sponsoring that bill will be the only two who will be speaking. Um, I did reach out to our, our lobbyist with our educational organizations. This is the only type of testimony that has been um, scheduled. And again, House Bill 290 um, is basically to expand um, vouchers that are available to uh, children in the state of Ohio. 
Uh, we have approximately 165,000 students that attend chartered private schools. Um, there are approximately 33,000 homeschooled students, um, and then another 30,000 students currently attending non-chartered private schools. So that's 228,000 students who are either homeschooled or attending private schools. Um, if this, and I'm a finance person, so of course I'm looking at the cost. And so the cost that has been estimated based on just giving the vouchers to the students who are currently enrolled in private school and homeschooled, you would be looking at over a billion dollars annually just for those students, not any additional students who would choose to then go to private uh, school or be, or be homeschooled. It would be a cost of at least $1 billion annually just for the students. That's an additional cost, right? Additional cost. Additional $1 billion. So I know that's one of those questions that's been brought up. Um, and I wanted to just put that out. Of course, I have big concerns about that. We talked about um, school funding and Julie mentioned that um, House Bill 110 um, established a new way that we fund schools in the state of Ohio and we proposed, uh, the Fair School Funding Plan was a proposal for a six year phase in, um, which if it was fully phased in, Butler Tech would not have to lobby as much about that cap. Um, but again, it's only a two year, um, they only agreed to do two years. So just lots of, things, but I wanted to just kind of talk about what is the saddest, what I learned today. Um, the other thing for any of our community who would like to watch that sponsor testimony, you can view any of these committee meetings on the Ohio channel. So you can go to the Ohio channel, the finance committee will be online, you can watch that live, they will record them and you can watch it later if you would like to. But um, the other thing I want to say is I'm encouraged by just our community being interested in um, the school funding or um, things that are, are going on at the state level. Um, so, you know, reach out to your legislator. That's the other thing. This is a this is a this is in the house, um, and actually one of the co-sponsors of this. Um, is Jennifer Gross, who, who represents Lakota. And so I would encourage you, you know, pro or con, what, if you reach out to your representatives um, and let them know how you feel about things, so. Anything further? That's it. So I have several things, Kelly, if that's all right. I'll go ahead and walk through those. Um, We've been asked by several people if we were willing to do some kind of a resolution that stated we supported this and we didn't support it. Quite honestly, I, I wanna show this to you. This is not normal. This bill is 19 lines, not 19 pages, 19 lines long. There's no detail to it. There's absolutely nothing that tells you how it's going to be implemented or anything really to object to at this point in time. So I think we need to continue to track it but there needs to be a lot more to it before you can voice an opinion on it. So appreciate what you're saying, Jenny. I just would like to see a little more to it before we say anything. Um, to let the board know as a reminder, OSB Spring Conference is March 8th at Laurel Oaks Career Campus from 5 to 8 p.m. And there will be membership and legislative updates there on OB OSBA. There's also a couple of opportunities for professional development for the board tomorrow morning at 8.30, it's a, just a half an hour coffee chat. And it's talking about district finances, sustainability and ROI return on investment. And it's free of charge. It's a nice moment to go and just get an update on some things that are going on. And that's offered by Ohio Analytics. There is also a town hall on Tuesday, February 22nd that runs from 5.30 to 6.30. And again, free of charge. And that will be a legislative update and a membership update as well. 
The other piece that I found of great interest, and I, I hope some of you will join me in this, we're in this process of our facilities master planning. There is an upcoming series offered through, you go through OSBA, but Jenny will need to know tonight because you have to be a part of OASBO in order to sign up for it. And it's about school construction, talks about the fundamentals in the beginning school facility projects, capital financing, understanding bonds and insurance, and then different construction phases. And if you're interested in that, please take a look and let Jenny know that first meeting is tomorrow at 12 p.m. And then there's another one on the 16th. And then it goes out over the week, uh, over the upcoming weeks. So please let her know if you're interested. Tomorrow's the first one? Tomorrow is the first one. <laughs> And then I have a flyer on the spring conference just in case anyone needs that. It'll just be a reminder then. There's also a Board Leadership Institute, May 6th through 7th in Columbus. You need to go through that in order to register for that. Um, one piece that Julie already referenced this, other action the House voted 80 to one to concur with the Senate amendments to House Bill 51 which allows public bodies to continue meeting virtually through the end of the fiscal year. So we do have that opportunity, I assume, to vote and to participate until June 31st. Has he signed the bill? June 30th. Did they sign it today? I have not heard that the governor has signed it yet, yeah. but it has passed both sides. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, the last piece, I have a trustee meeting for the Ohio School Board Association Board of Trustees that will be coming up on February 26th. And at this point in time, there are 19 states working together with OSBA to develop an alternative to NSBA and expect to see 2023 events and conferences. Ellen? Uh, I'm not the person anymore. I'm sorry. You're right. Isaac, don't do know. you have anything further? No. I don't. That's the force of habit. <laughs> I was like, I could come up with something. <laughs> yeah. Anything, Isaac? No, not too. All right, any questions on legislation? We will move on. Number nine, administrative report, superintendent update. Most of my updates already been addressed through our conversations earlier this evening. The only other thing I wanna mention is our, our COVID numbers um, have come down. I mean, we were told by um, our healthcare professionals that we consult with um, in the Department of Health that this latest variant would get better and it's starting to. Um, if you remember, um, in early to mid January, we had to take a day off, not because our numbers were so high, they were, but we couldn't staff and we had to take a, a calamity day, um, from that peak. And thanks to Mr. Vogelman for doing the math for me, but from that peak until today, we were about 90% better to the good in number of positive cases. So, um, whether you're on this side or that side, uh, the end result is we're doing a lot better. That's not to discount those that are still suffering and um, that are going through it because it's not fun at all, as we know. Um, but overall, the numbers are getting better. And hopefully that's a good indication that uh, this will be past us sooner than later. We are on day 703. Wow. That's actually kind of depressing. I don't think I needed to hear that. It's still depressing, but, you know, it is what it is. Did you have anything else? Um, no, I would admit, my only other comment uh, to back up what you said earlier is, you know, we've gone through this for two years, 703 days, um, but we are keeping our, we've kept our kids in. I don't think we probably give our parents and teachers enough credit for making it all work and not having to have shut down or canceled things. So kudos to them. That's it. Do you want to go ahead and bring that up? It's okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Miller, I have a. I thought you're going to be mentioning about my concern on social emotional learning. Are you going to give us an update on that? Yeah, yeah. So that was tied into we're going to do an audit, including social emotional learning coming up. So um, we're taking a look at what we do now in terms of social emotional learning K6. And that's going to be part of the audit that we're going to do hopefully this spring. So, so what, what would the audit? I thought social emotional learning is already establishing and it's accepted in the system. Yeah, we, we do have classes tied into social emotional learning. Some of it's directed to the COVID fallout, but we're gonna take a look and audit what we're doing with SEL, with social emotional learning, and see what changes and tweaks we have to make, especially since we were in essentially year one of doing that. Okay, 
I think I'm going to make, I'll be making, uh, I'm going to be voicing my concern on yeah. some of the requests I made before right. on social emotional learning. Yep. And they're part no of the Ohio's to. learning standards. They are part of the Ohio learning standards as well. But I'll bring you into the fold when we go through, in, in the whole board, I'll, go, I'll bring you into the fold when we go through what the audit's going to take a look at and what we've done with SEL. But that does not we mean be... we have to implement SEL into our school. It, no, if, it does not. Please, uh, thank you. not law. So I know to, to your point, Mr. Adi. Yes. Let's rephrase. I, I know that there there might be some concerns around SEL from yes. some of our parents, mm -hmm. and we've tried to address those. Yes. So when they come up, we'll continue to do that. But as you know, it's such an overall branching term. Some of the some of the pieces in SEL are good. Some of them maybe not so good, and we have to take a look at that. Yeah. And I know that's what your concern is probably. But I think that's a personal judgment, right? Because I believe that the parents, some parents want to opt out. Yeah. So it shouldn't be a mandatory program if some parents are not interested in it. So it should be optional. I think there are some parts that they could be probably opt out of. We have to take a look at what, what that is and what okay. matches up. Okay. So I'm agreeing with you. Yes. Should we expect to see changes for next school year? Later? Absolutely. Always. <laughs> Thank you. We're never finished. And, and I also voice a, um, a concern on uh, the data collection company mm -hmm. that is involved. Okay. We'll Panorama. Too. Panorama. Yeah. Which we're, we're looking at uh, the effectiveness of Panorama uh, moving forward. So are we using Panorama right now? We, we do use some, some components of Panorama right now. Yes. Okay. So that's one of my concerns as well. Yep. So we'll look for a future update. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? This is Logan. Probably. Todd, can you? Okay, I, I'm going to quickly go through this. I promise. I only have six slides, um, <laughs> but it's it's on board docs and on the screen. I one of the questions that I know we get quite a bit is, um, well, maybe. There we go. <laughs> How are we spending our ESSER monies? So I, I wanted to just kind of go through this um, tonight. Again, I know people have seen this slide on different um, presentations, but in all um, with COVID re federal relief, um, the district, it has been allocated almost $20 million um, to date. Prior to July 1, we had spent almost 3.8 million with a remaining $15.8 million to spend. Okay. <laughs> Allowable uses. So ESSER 1 and 2, we have three different um, phases, if you will, of, of ESSER monies. Um, how we are to spend those monies on both or all three, prevent, prepare for, and respond to COVID-19, which is a pretty broad, you know, way on how you can spend those monies. On the third round, though, you'll see the pre prevent, prepare, and respond, but then you also see that 20% of those funds have to be spent on addressing learning loss. Um, there was a requirement for us to have a safe return of in-person instruction, and to Matt's point, we were in-person, <laughs> um, so safe return was kind of silly because we'd already been here and the continuity of services plan. The continuity of services plan includes how we're spending those funds as well. Um, and then a maintenance of equity. And basically what that maintenance of equity means is we cannot take all of these dollars and throw them into schools um, and spend more per pupil on one group of students 
over what we spend with another group of students. So it has to be equitable. Um, and there is a calculation that is done to prove that we are being equitable in how we're spending those funds. Can I ask a question on that? Yeah. I would think with the learning loss that there may be certain groups that would need more intervention or you know, some of our students with special needs who may not have gotten the full services while we were limited. So that seems challenging to manage that you wouldn't change that because there would be different investment needs based on the needs of the students. And it's not how we normally allocate special education funds, so. So, yes, <laughs> um, and there are some requirements um, that I will tell you we're still learning about. ODE, I went to a, um, a seminar two weeks ago probably where they're giving us further clarification on exactly how that's going to be calculated and how they're going to test it. Um, so we're learning more, um, but I will say our federal monies, there, there are other federal monies that we get that go through a very similar test. Um, and you can't throw all of your federal money um, at, let's just say, um, students who um, are socioeconomically disadvantaged without also looking at um, your special needs students, your English language learners, your students who don't fall into any of those categories. So there's, there's a test with other federal dollars. And like I said, we're learning more. And as we learn more, I will let you know more. Um, the local use of funds plan. This is just a link to our continuity plan on our website. And that's the first page. It's pretty prescriptive on what had to be in there and what we had to address. Like I mentioned, the last page of it is how we are going to spend those ESSER three dollars. And ESSER three is almost $12 million. So this chart, while to me, oh yes, this makes total sense, um, it's not really all that. Um, it's not all that explanatory to our public. So what I've tried to do is I've taken that chart that we have to uh, put together. And this is the way that for all of our reporting, it has to be done. Below that, I tried to break it down and say, but here's in layman's terms, this is what that means. So for our one-to-one -one going down to grade six, um, for FY 22 through 24, $5.4 million for that. Our MTSS supervisors, almost 1.4 million. What is an MTSS? Say what an MTSS, multi-tiered support system. Yeah, my, do you want to talk about what that looks like? Yeah, it's, it's PBIS. Well, there we go again. Yeah, yeah. Multi-tiered student supports for our kids. Use your words, PBIS. Um. I just want to it's clarify basically it meeting the needs of our, right. our students um, who really just wanted you to tell the public what the acronym means. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. Students in need um, were support systems. We have a support system around support them. System. Multi tiered. And it's it's throughout every the child, every child. Um, what we do. VLO is our virtual learning option. Um, for the administration of that summer school, um, offset the cost of four custodians because part of this is about keeping things clean. Um, our um, MTSS software, Apex credit recovery software, uh, secondary tutors and building subs, our student classroom supply kits, extended school year stipends, our nursing staff, so you'll see those, um, those different costs and how I broke those apart also goes up and does, that's where you get the almost $12 million. So 
that's kind of what I wanted to show you tonight is to hopefully, I know I get this question a, a lot in, but I wanted to put it in a chart and to just kind of give that information so that hopefully it's a little clearer to you as a board, as well as, as the community. So any questions you might have? Thank you for those numbers. You're welcome. <laughs> um, I wanted to discuss addressing learning loss. What does that look like? How are we measuring it? And um, what action plans do we have? I think Mr. Coney spoke at a recent board meeting about this, but one of the probably clearest examples of um, some addressing some of the learning loss is in my opinion, um, the literacy issues that we're gonna have at the younger grade levels. And that's why um, the board decided um, to have reading supports, particularly at kindergarten um, for our students, more so than what we've had before because those kids haven't had a full normal experience and our first graders haven't either. So that would be one example of addressing the learning loss. Um, it also comes through the MTSS system um, tier one, tier two, tier three supports um, for our kids. And so addressing a learning loss isn't something um, new um, for us because we have kids with different needs and different issues that um, and different gaps for a multitude of reasons, as I'm sure you know, um, that they address. So I know that Keith has um, talked about this at board meetings at length. And I know that he's also doing probably be part of our community conversation that we're having on February 20. I'll get to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. But am I right? You are not. Okay. <laughs> not the first time. Um, <laughs> I'm relieved. I'm relieved. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we can, if, if, he's, if it's not part of that community conversation, we can have it as something in the future. An upcoming community An conversation. An upcoming community conversation. We did change the type of topic, sorry. So, um, so I can get more to you on that. That's easy for us to get to you. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yes, Ms. Logan, I, one thing that strikes me here and I like is the fact that strings are not attached to federal aids regarding vaccines and masks. That is correct. So I love to, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you so much. Yeah, for I mean, uh, sometimes I will put things on a chart and I forget to mention it again. And I thank you for pointing that out. Um, that is one of those questions that we have gotten quite a few times. And there are no strings attached to this money that we get. We do not have to force staff or students to have the vaccine or to wear a mask in order to get this money, so. And this, this board and this administration has never said we were gonna vaccinate kids or staff for that part. That keeps coming up and still comes up, even came up tonight through some of the comments. So in case anybody didn't hear that, we, we heard a local news station put out a incorrect information tonight. You wanna to say it one more time? We, we have not considered, nor will we consider vaccinating students or staff. Thank okay. you. And that's been an ongoing thing. And I've said it probably every meeting and it keeps coming up and I'll keep saying we haven't and we're not. Thank you. Any more questions on our ESSER update? Thank you, Jenny. Hey, one more quick question. Just do we have any, are there any summer programs that are in the works that would be related to this for additional support? Yes. So part of the plan on uh, spending this money is summer school. And so I know that Kim, and I'm going to say McGowan, and that is not her last name now. <laughs> Melzer. I'm sorry, Kim. Uh, Kim Melzer, um, we have met. There is a plan on how to um, basically make summer school, summer school 2.0, a little bit um, heavier to meet some of that learning loss. And so that is one of the ways that we're planning on spending the money. Thank you. Any more quick questions? Okay. All right. Thank you, Jenny. Mm -hmm. I know that's been a question from our community, so thank you for addressing it. Uh, we move to new business. I believe you have something. I do have some new business because I believe that it was inadvertent, but the community engagement committee report was left off of the agenda. Oh. So I'm going to do it under new business, if that's yes. okay. Is that okay? It's very quick. Just that February 24th, 
is the community conversation where we will be talking about the four E's and a portrait of a graduate. Defining the four E's, so Mr. Coney will give us a brief presentation and then there'll be an opportunity just like the rest of our community conversations with some questions and some small group discussion. So that'll be February 24th from 6.30 to eight in this room. Um, we do ask that you sign up. It's not a, you know, you have to sign up to come, but it just gives us an idea of how many people are going to be here in case we would have to move it downstairs to a larger location. Then March 23rd is an additional community conversation, 6.30 to 8 in this building again. And the topic is in conjunction with our regular facilitator, facilitator excuse me, and um, our educational consultant for our mattress facility plan. And it will be educating children post-pandemic. So that is where um, Mr. Miller, we will be able to delve into the PT or the MTSS stuff. So those two community conversations. And then one other, I have one other quick announcement. Um, as you know, there's a button on the website that you can email the entire board and thankfully you are using it. So we appreciate that. Um, so what, when going forward, when you hit that button and send us an email, you will get an automatic response that says we have received your email. We know there's been some issues. People are not sure whether or not emails are going through. So you will get an automatic response that said, we have received your email and that yes, we do read all your emails. So that's all. Thank you, Kelly. Any questions? For, um, okay, I'm done. Move to number 11 board action items. It is to adopt a resolution to end COVID protocols. I believe the board has received that. It's also on the agenda for this evening and everyone has had a chance to read that. I do wanna note before I accept a motion that I received a late amendment to that today. So please scroll to line 18. And this has been added to the resolution, except for mask, on school buses, which will not go into effect until March 18th, 2022, with the lifting of the federal transportation requirement. And I believe that was based on some um, legal language that we got back. So I will accept a motion to adopt the resolution to end the COVID protocols as presented. So moved. Thank you, is there a second? The chair will second for the purpose of discussion. The floor is open. All right, as you all know, um, legal weighed in yesterday regarding the possible federal requirements governing certain types of transportation and the use of masks. So to take into consideration that communication and ensure that we are not in conflict with what may be applicable governmental requirements or mandates, specifically a federal requirement that may apply to buses, I have amended the line 18 of my resolution in which the last sentence will read, as what you just said, except for masks on school buses, which will not go in effect until March 18th, 2022, with the lifting of the federal transportation requirement. Again, I want to be very clear. I am presenting information that is in the public domain. Anyone who takes five seconds to examine it will see that it comes from a multitude of sources. I'm presenting it so parents and others in the district are as comprehensively informed as possible about these critical issues. This resolution is nothing more than an acknowledgement of this information and suggests that the school district needs to get out from in between parents and the health of their children until the professionals in the medical field or in the medical research and public health departments can agree on something actionable. At this time, they do, they do not, and the evidence of that and the hundreds of pieces of research, analysis, and expert commentary that is contained in the supporting documents to this resolution. Health departments in the state of Ohio are not requiring the use of masks, the submission to a vaccine, nor are there any legal orders to quarantine. Call, all of call, which, uh, call it a question. All of which require due process, which involves- I'm sorry, Mrs. Bodie. Bodie. Mr. D has raised call the question. Yeah. So we'll take a vote. Should discussion continue or- I think we've read- You want to take a vote? I need to see a show of hands. Whether or not we want to continue discussion, I'm fine yeah. without. I, I, I'm fine to vote. I mean, I, I think I said everything last meeting, but I yeah, I think we debated this last time, and I appreciate um, 
Mrs. Bodie's opinions and that she has shared those extensive articles. Um, I have concern that, again, some of the sources that were used and whether they would even be acceptable to our English teachers on a paper. So I'm not sure that I'm in so agreement. So we need to stop discussion. I'm really, sorry. I just need to I'm see sorry. a vote for sorry. continue the discussion no. or take a vote. We can take a vote. So by a show of hands, continue the discussion. By a show of hands, take a vote. We'll need to take the vote. Mrs. Logan? Mrs. Bodie? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? No. Mr. Adi? No. Mrs. Casper? No. Mrs. Schaefer? No. The motion fails. Thank you. We'll move on to number 12. And thank you, Mrs. Bowie. Move on to number 12, the treasurer's recommendations, action items. We have approved the monthly board minutes for January 10th and January 24th. Approved monthly finance reports and approved Fidelity Investment Services Agreement. I'll take a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Casper. Thank you, Mrs. Schaefer. So the thing that you're going to see different um, on my items is um, C, approved fidelity investment services agreement. So the way it works, and this has not happened since I've been here, but um, if someone like Fidelity has at least 15 of our employees who wants to have a payroll deduction that would go directly to Fidelity, then they gather those signatures and they give it to me and then I bring it to you as a board, you approve it, and then I can set up that payroll deduction. So that's what this is. And it's why you don't, it's the first time I've had this happen since I've been here. So. That's what this is. So the requirement to do this is new? The requirement is not new and it's actually in law, um, but we just have not had this actually happen. Never had enough or? Correct. People that wanted to. All right. I would like to pull B out for. Have we finished that vote? This is something. So if she would like to. You could amend the motion to say you want to strike the monthly financial reports. B. Are you referring to 12? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Okay. I'm ahead. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Got it. So the motion stands that we are approving A through C treasurer's recommendations. Mrs. Logan. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. Schaefer? Yes. Mr. Adi? Yes. Mrs. Bodie? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor. Yes. Thank you. We will move to 13 superintendent recommendations, action items, approved personnel items, A, approve a resolution authorizing 2022-2023 membership in the Ohio School Athletic Association and approve field trip C and D, approved donations. I heard Mrs. Bodie wanted to pull B. Yes. Vote on it separately. Okay. So I'll take a motion to approve A, C, and D. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Schaefer. Second. Thank you, Mr. D. Jenny. Mrs. Schaefer. Yes. Mr. Adi. Yes. Mrs. Casper. Yes. Mrs. Bodie. Yes. Mrs. O'Connor. Yes. I'll take a motion to approve B, which is the authorizing membership in the Ohio School High School Athletic Association. So moved. Thank you, Mrs. Casper. The chair will second. Second. I beat you Se to it. I beat you to oh, it, you Mr. D. <laughs> but thank you. You're welcome. All right, I have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? Yes, I would ask, I would like to ask that we postpone <clears throat> this vote. Um, on OHSAA, they have a DEI 
summit coming up in April and I'm not comfortable with their requirement. So I would like to go to that summit to um, observe what they are discussing with DEI. And then I would all, I'm, not, I'm also not comfortable with the requirements to ask for pronouns in their sex at the beginning of the season of their paperwork. For several years, the OSHA athletes physical form completed by the student's phys physician asks for student sex assigned at birth and also their current gender of identity. So that is, um, children are there. So basically children are there to play sports, not express their sexual identity, which is, all, which is only a small part of their identity. I'm concerned that this will make some of the students uncomfortable who are not ready to express their sexual identity and who just want to play a sport like the rest of the class. This is divisive and singling out our students who are different. As in the statement above, they are also forcing our students to question their sex and promoting that this is an option, therefore potentially confusing our children. I would like to go to the DEI summit in April. And then this only this is due date is June 30th. So I think we have plenty of time to kind of do some research and make a decision on this. Can can I ask some clarifying or Give you some clarifying. We do comments. something procedurally okay. first. So that's an amendment to the motion to accept it. Is that correct? No. We did that one. Vote on it first and then. Okay. So we need to go ahead and vote on the original, um, the original um, motion, which was to approve a resolution authorizing this. Mrs. Bodie has suggested for the purposes of discussion, postponing the vote. Or do you want to just talk about membership or anything else you have to say about approving the resolution? And perhaps, Mr. Miller, before we do that, perhaps you could explain yeah. what it what it entitles or what it entails and what happens with our students. Sure. Um, I guess my, my first comment would be, if you know of a situation where this has impacted one of our kids, let me know. And um, our athletic directors and the coaches do a really good job of um, making things work for our kids and families. And they have been. We have two of the best athletic directors in the state of Ohio. Um, if you vote no on OHSAA, our kids, you're limiting our students' opportunities and options. They will no longer be able to participate in postseason tournaments, games, state championships. That's gonna impact scholarships. You're taking away an op opportunity for our kids who we have some kids that um, need sports more than the teams need them. And um, that would be a detriment. I could see it impacting uh, families and impacting Westchester and Liberty Township in terms of people not wanting to come here if we can't, we don't provide those opportunities for our kids. Um, I know no, no of no other public school that offers sports that's not a member of OHSAA. I know they're not perfect. Um, and I know they have things to work on like we all do. Um, but I, I've never heard that their DEI initiatives um, would impact adversely impact our kids or coaches or families. But again, by voting no on OHSA, you're saying no to state champions. You're saying no to college scholarships for our kids, for them to go on and play. You're saying no to athletic trainers. You're saying no to cheerleaders. You're saying essentially you're killing sports in Lakota. I didn't say that I was wanting to vote no. I just wanted to. I'm just telling you that if you do, research. that's what's going to happen. If the, if the board as a body does, that's what would happen. The due date is until June 30th. So I think it would just give us some time to make that decision. I worry about the message that that sends to our kids and families. Okay. One at a time board, something else? I just, there's, I don't think that there's, we have not had any issues with OHSSA in the past or any of their DEI initiatives. I, I don't think anything that Mrs. Bodie hears at a conference would change my mind. That's just my opinion. It's too, it's limiting too many opportunities for our students. Mrs. Shaken. Um, I'm comfortable with my vote. Mr. D? Yes. Um, I believe that you have you have a, a very good concern, which I think everybody has, but we have to also weigh the uh, the event that we do not continue with this uh, association. There are many, 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 many companies out there that I don't agree with because of their policies. Um, I Google every day. Do I like Google? No, but I have to Google. I go, I use Facebook every day. Do I have to use Facebook? Yes, because I don't have any option. I use Facebook. Do I like their policy? No. 
uh, I use YouTube. Do I like that policy? No, but because I don't have any option, I have to use it. So at this point, I believe that we're gonna deny our students opportunities that you mentioned. Uh, and I also believe that in the past, we've never, had any, we've never had any issue like that. If there is, we'll address it. So for that, I believe that we need to stay, stay with this association. And I'm gonna go for that. Any further discussion? No. All right, seeing no further discussion, we have a motion on the floor to approve a resolution authorizing 2022-2023 membership in the Ohio High School Athletic Association. Mrs. Logan, please call the roll. Mrs. Casper? Yes. Mrs. O'Connor? Yes. Mr. Adi? Yes. Mrs. Bodie? I abstain. I do not have enough information to make a vote. Mrs. Schaefer? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. We'll move to 14 to our second pub public comment section. Is there a sign in at the back for the second? That's it. All right. Mrs. Hajaja, Hajaya, Hajaji, you are up. So I was just, can you hear me? I was just going back to, cause I didn't get heard from the original when we were talking about the masks. So I would like to address the board about the mask mandates. And I was really excited to see the other side of the pandemic. It feels like we're almost there. Keeping the mask mandates in effect will indoctrinate our children more. And as the days go by, the masks, as the days go by, masks are filthy and full of staph and E. coli, et cetera. Keeping our children in a box behind masks that limits their oxygen intake makes for fear and lower grade ratings. It also is more likely that the child will get an infection from the mask rather than the virus. It's time to let the mask go. I believe if you want your child to wear a mask, it should be prescribed by the doctor to keep all children safe, where masks are not just thrown around off onto the ground with viruses all over them. Children these days are already trying to identify themselves. The mask adding to the stress to them will, uh, will only add stress to them mentally and physically. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Thank you, Mrs. Hajaji. <laughs> I think I'll go with that one next time if that's okay. I used to get speech therapies and get that one wraps around my Hard. Thank you. Um, Again, thank you for weighing in on masks. As you've heard tonight and, and throughout many of our meetings, there are a lot of different opinions yeah. on masks and we appreciate you sharing yours with us. Thank you for that. Board, we will move to closing comments. Is there another sign in? If they didn't say it's on an agenda item, then it would be for the second. All right. We have got to redo this form. <laughs> I apologize. So we will start with Mr. or Mrs. Aldridge, Aldridge, Corbin. Uh, <laughs> sorry, my handwriting is terrible. <laughs> so is mine, Corbin. It really is. I get it. It's all good. It's all good. So, uh, so good evening. My name is Corbin Minch. So I've lived in this community now for, uh, for over 18 years, and I have two kids that are in the uh, Lakota school, uh, school system. So my wife and I originally moved to this area due to the quality of the school systems. I think like many others, the schools are a big reason to join the Westchester and, and uh, Liberty Township areas. Just from a professional standpoint, I will tell you I have over 15 years managing and leading employees in a corporate office environment. So the reason I'm here is because I wanted to address my concerns over the removal of the passage that we've been talking about tonight regarding curriculum. It's my opinion that the passage should remain it's written and leave the policy alone. Today, requests from school board about class content can be made to the superintendent, as long as such requests are not unduly onerous. 
And granted, I will grant, I will, I will say yes, onerous is a little bit subjective, but presumably a reasonable person would know when requests would rise to that level. I would also have to ask, has a school board member made reasonable requests and those have been somehow denied? And if the answer is no, then uh, no restriction of access has occurred. And uh, really just removing that section is like trying to put the uh, court, the cart before the horse. I can think, uh, you know, I can imagine that, you know, school board members, you know, pulling classroom material from our teachers and what message does that send? What, do, what message does that send to them? I'm sure a talented teaching staff does not need or want to be micromanaged in this manner. Anyone who's managed people in a business knows that employees do not perform their best when they're being micromanaged. All that ends up happening is they tend to be disengaged. They can't flex when they're, uh, when they're presented with a new challenge and turnover just increases. And I know the board is concerned about that. So the role of the school board is to provide governance. It's not to set it's curriculum. We should allow the folks who have training in educational curriculum to do the job that they were hired to do. And as a leader, it's my job when I have them to seek out individuals to perform tasks that I'm not qualified to do. Let's make sure that we do that here too. So I understand a few parents across the district have, cons have expressed concern about transparency and, uh, and what the teacher is teaching their, their child in the classroom. And to those parents, I would uh, say, I'm glad you're talking to your child and are engaged in their education. But as we know, there is a form if they're having concerns. Over the years in the district, there've been a few teachers that I know have held views differently from uh, those in my family. Facebook does exist. <laughs> and uh, in these instances, they've provided a great opportunity for discussion with our children and a chance to reaffirm our family values. I would encourage all parents to embrace these types of moments with their children as well. They're only young ones. Thank you. Thank you. Is it all rich? Corbin, is it all rich? Corbin, Mitch. Mitch. That's an unusual so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that translation. <laughs> Brian Buckingham, you're up. And Maureen Molly will be right after that. I'm excited to be talking about something that I hope transcends politics and controversy. <laughs> um, so I'm proud to be one of the founding board members of Lakota Cares, the group that's representing special needs uh, students with disabilities and their families in the district. Um, I heard the number 17,000 a lot tonight. That's the number of students in our district. The other number that we should remember is 2,100. That's 12 and a half percent of our population, of our student population in Lakota, who are considered students with special needs. Now, students are among the most misunderstood and the most vulnerable. And many of them figuratively and literally do not have a voice. I wrote down as we were talking all of the things that are being discussed, finance, facilities planning, curriculum, DEI, SEL, security, masking, staffing, all of these things are being discussed and that's a lot. And so you might be wondering why would this guy be coming up and asking me to do more work, to consider one more thing. Our group is not asking you to do more work. We're asking for perspective instead. Our students that we represent, our families, we have unique situations. That 12 and a half percent is disproportionately representing complexity and uniqueness in every family in this district and we need to understand what these families are going through when we're developing and considering and debating the impact of policy. Mr. Buckingham. Yes. We started that a bit late, so I'm going to ask you to wrap yeah. up, please. So I'd like to thank Mr. Miller uh, and anyone on the board uh, for uh, putting us on the agenda here at an upcoming meeting. Um, we look forward to being part of this discussion. We want these students to be part of the collective consciousness of our district and our community. If they're forgotten, if the special context of their education is not considered every time you make a decision 
if you don't consider the impact, it's not just a mistake, it's a tragedy. And if you can do that, I promise you, there will be no truer form of public service that you'll ever do. Thank you, sir. Mrs. Mal is up next and Mrs. Greer is up next after that. Hello, um, I'm Maureen Mel, and I am also a founding board member of Lakota Cares. And I just wanted to share a little bit of why it's so important. Um, so I have three girls. I have one who is seven, one's five, and one's two and a half. So I'm sleep deprived. But my <laughs> seven, my seven-year-old is one in one of your amazing environments called a social communication classroom. Um, whether you know what that is or you don't, please get to know what it is. It is a classroom for um, typically for children with autism that don't communicate the way that we typically do. My daughter is one of the individuals that would not be able to come up and talk with you without using her assisted technology. Um, she does not, she maybe has five spoken words that she can utilize, but she has an amazing staff that help and support her. But my experience with her is much different than my experience with my typically developing child. As far as, and I think this is why it's so important to have these conversations and to have transparency when it comes to special education. I can't know the names of the children in my daughter's class because of law, because they're on IEPs and I get that. But it's hard to also develop that social skills or get to know other parents that maybe are experiencing the same kind of things when I can't know who they are. I can't have a conversation with my daughter and say, you know, hey, how was so-and-so in your class? Because I don't have their names. I don't know that information. I, it is very, very challenging. Um, I think a lot of us that have children with different needs we feel very isolated. And so having an organization, having a parent support group, having a community that says, we still see you is important. We've um, little things that I don't think people understand um, unless they ask questions. We've been in this district since she was three and um, or we have, we've been here since she was three. She's been in Lakota preschool and so forth, but like carnivals, extracurricular activities, we don't feel comfortable taking to her a lot of those. I've joined, I've joined the PTO at Heritage where she goes and they've been amazing with being supportive. But I think about the parents that necessarily don't have the opportunity to join the PTOs or ask um, those questions and saying, hey, how can we make this more accessible? Can we have a, a room that is for kids that need to take a break during these big activities? And a lot of it is just education. People don't know that that is a need. And I think that's why it's important that we have groups like this and that we recognize them and support them as a district. Thank you. Thank you very much. I apologize for my phone. It showed it was turned off, but I guess it wasn't. Uh, Mrs. Greer is up next and Mrs. Richardson will follow. Hello. Good. <laughs> you know what? It's the, my emergency number. Did you? Um, I'm sorry. I agree. Uh, I've been a Lakota parent for six years now. My son started uh, his elementary at a private school that didn't serve him well. Uh, when he started Lakota, he tested into gifted services an accelerated curriculum and he has flourished. Um, he has had access to so many opportunities and a diverse uh, pool of kids to be friends with. Uh, so thank you, Lakota. Because of this, I feel really strong about uh, the public schools and I wanna ask uh, if it will be possible for um, the, the district to address uh, the bill that's being put in front of uh, the state le legislature. Um, I think it's a killer for public schools, just like um, uh, parents with special needs need the, the school to serve their kids. So do many of us. 
I am also concerned with what seems to be the radicalization of this board. Um, the resolution that was brought up really um, doesn't, doesn't help. And my concern is that it weaken, it, it seemed to weaken the response of the board uh, on, on, an array of, of health issues beyond COVID. Uh, so I do ask the board to um, look at the big picture in future resolutions. Um, the Lakota program of studies defines a Lakota graduate as someone who, has a, who is a critical thinker and reasons effectively and makes sound judgment and decision. Um, I think the board, as it is right now, is not supporting that and is not modeling that for our students. Uh, some of the things that have been discussed have been supported with questionable sources, um, like a known misinformation machine um, from China. And um, that is really concerning. Um, to all of us that the decisions that are made here impact our kids and their education. So I do ask that uh, board members are more proactive into learning the ropes and, um, and into um, taking their, their role seriously. Um, about curriculum, I do think it should be left to the educators. They are board members that are not educators and they should listen to the experts. Um, regarding public comment, I am concerned about our decision as residents or our comments as you residents may, you may being us, diluted by, by non-residents. That's all, thank you. Thank you. It's a team effort, thank you all. Mrs. Richardson is up and Mrs. Reuter follows. Hi, Jennifer Richardson. Um, in regards to the Zoom participation, this is 2022. There must be a way to verify identities of people so that they might participate via Zoom. Why, pass, why rule against comments via Zoom participation for possible cheaters? Let's be accessible for all those who are honest, um, honest about their identities. Curriculum. This attack on teachers is truly awful. Our teachers need to be supported and their profession needs to be respected. Some on the school board have absolutely no experience in education. Why would we trust you to determine what is best for curriculum for our students? Knowing and using someone's preferred pronouns is not divisive, it's called respect. And finally, regarding Jennifer Lopez, Dr. Dre, Eminem, and all the spectators at the school or Super Bowl, had to show proof of vaccination or proof of negative test. Two of our parents were actually there and they have firsthand knowledge of that fact. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Richardson. Mrs. Reuter and Mrs. Cameron will follow. Bridget Reuter, um, I had some comments prepared about an email that I sent on February 5th to the board. I have not received a response. It was regarding the um, attendance of board members at an Empower You training. Um, I would appreciate a thoughtful response that does not include the board, the board values your feedback. I would like an actual response to that and I will continue to come to the mic until I get a response. So that's, I'm respectfully asking for that. Um, I rewrote my comments tonight because of some things that happened during this meeting. Um, my family spent 14 years in this district, and fortunately, my kids were very well prepared when they left the district to attend private high schools. Let me say at this point that I'm thrilled that they're not here anymore. I am disgusted by what I have seen slowly creep into this district over the past few years. Every single policy that was discussed tonight has been twisted by people's political leanings. This district is one of the largest districts in the state and is often looked at as an example. The behavior and actions of this board are being scrutinized very, very closely. To have this type of unprofessional behavior displayed in board meetings is embarrassing and that's an understatement. That's the nice way I'll say it. 
you all have jobs to do to effectively serve all the stakeholders in this district. You cannot do that if you all you are doing is looking through your partisan lens. Please do better. Thank you, Mrs. Reuter. Mrs. Cameron is up. Mrs. Dresden Soles Peters follows. Hello and good evening. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak. I wanted to thank our amazing educators, student resource officers, administrators, school nurses, counselors, bus drivers, cafeteria staff, janitorial staff, substitute teachers, as well as anyone else I missed for all that they do to support our children each day. None of their jobs are easy on a normal day, nevertheless, during what we have experienced throughout the, two, the last two years. When I volunteer at my children's schools, I see the connection these staff members have with the students. While so much has changed, the love and eagerness to help our children remains unchanged. I hear a lot of attacks towards educators and the public education system in general. I have to wonder if those attacking the schools are seeing something totally different than I am, or maybe they're not in the schools at all. We have principals who have had to adapt, drop off and pick up lines with little notice. We've, I've had maps drawn on, on the day that the parent pickup lines have to be changed. Teachers have had to be more pliable than usual with lesson plans due to having so many absences. They have had to double their normal work due to needing to post lesson assignments online. Nurses spend hours on the phone with parents and not all of those conversations are friendly. Our subs are working more than ever and bus drivers have picked up different routes suddenly. Workloads of reading specialists have increased. Despite what has become a very stressful environment due to the aforementioned changes, I see children giggling in the hallways. Class parties are just as fun as before. My point is circumstances have changed, dynamics have had to shift, but the love these Lakota staff members have for our kiddos remains unchanged. Thank you all for what you do. In regards to the Zoom community input, um, just like Jenny said, I don't know why we couldn't have a Google Doc that is posted on the Lakota District Communication Facebook page, and you can have people sign up prior to the meetings if they would like to speak, have somebody delegated to, to check the addresses and verify that they live in the district, um, and then close it down maybe an hour before the meeting starts so there's adequate time to review those people, or five hours before. Um, in regards to curriculum, I believe it is of utmost importance that we don't forget that qualifications matter, credentials matter, education matters. Regarding pronouns, my children's paperwork when we take them to the doctor asks for pronouns. Um, the medical community as a whole adapts this because it affects the mental health of children who are, you know, LGBTQIA. Um, the practice has been accepted and I want to ask if you have ever read a line like that and suddenly decided that you wanted to be a different gender or love a different group of people than you claimed to before. If reading a line like that has made you change your sexuality. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Peters is next. Souls Peter. Souls Peter and Mr. Horton will follow. Hello, as always, thank you so much for allowing us time to speak. It is so encouraging to know that you are dedicated to hearing from the community and that you want to hear from us. At the last board meeting, I asked a question that went unanswered. It was briefly discussed tonight. Would the board please allow members of our community to participate in public comments via Zoom? I understand this can present some challenges. Those who sign up will have to be cross-checked to make sure that they live in our community. If you're truly worried about identity, why are we not required to present ID upon signing up to speak? I could be using a false name and an empty address that I found on the auditor's website. I'm not. <laughs> why punish community members who want to participate? Perhaps you could have those who wish to comment via Zoom sign up ahead of time so that their addresses can be verified. I don't think that that's too difficult to ask. If time is a concern, then certainly we can make time for those who are attending the meeting via Zoom for various reasons perhaps allowing Zoom attendees half of the public comment time. These attendees are valuable members of our community who have just as much right to public comment as I do. If you really care about hearing from the entire community, then please make it possible. Would the board please allow members of our community to participate in public comments via Zoom? Thank you. 
Thank you, Mrs. Souls Peters. Mr. Horton is up next. Mr. Argo, you'll follow. Thank you, Doug Horton, 8207 Paddington Court, Westchester, Ohio, 45069. Uh, I was originally gonna to talk tonight in support of our teachers, but I was very happy to see the administration's support of our teachers so vociferously tonight. And I think what I would say would be redundant and pale in comparison. So I wanna thank him for supporting our teachers. Um, additionally, instead, I wanna also thank the board members who expressed their support tonight of prioritizing my right to come up and speak during public comment as a father of someone in the district, as a landowner in the district, as somebody who uh, is part of this community, over those who would come into our community and seek to attack it. We have experience in this district, and I've long been on the record that this district needs more input from families, more input from taxpayers, and less input from the political likes of Josh Mendel and scripting that is going on and seeking to disrupt our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horton. Mr. Argo. Uh, Alex Argo. Um, first of all, I uh, just wanted to hope say that I hope everything's all right uh, on your end, uh, Mrs. O'Connor. Um, but I, I did want to follow, do a quick follow up on uh, House Bill 290. Uh, since last time I spoke about it, uh, Mr. Miller weighed in uh, and is in loop with the soup. And so as Mrs. Logan and many others have asked the board to take a stance and contacted our legislators. Bills like this are often uh, left scant and then swapped out with large text right before a vote without any chance for the public to really weigh in, but the intent and main thrust of the bill is obvious. Does the board support the superintendent and the treasurer on this? What I'm asking is for the board to draft a resolution one way or the other on House Bill 290 and take a vote. How many times last year was it insisted upon a vote that would be taken so that the board stance on mass be known to the community? Moving on though, the issue I really wanted to talk about today is the proposed curriculum policy. It's a sad day that we're discussing this at all, but it seems like certain members of the board were elected on a curriculum witch hunt agenda. It's, it's clear that they want to micromanage our teachers and censor what is being taught in our schools. Now, short story, I literally just got off a flight and came straight here, uh, but we did briefly hit a bumpy patch of air on the way back to Cincinnati. Did I enjoy that? No. Did I go bang on the captain's door because I thought I could do a better job than the captain flying the airplane? Of course not. He had years of education, training, and certification at flying an airplane, just like our curriculum department and teachers have in teaching and adapting the state standards to our school's curriculum. Unlike my flight, I have yet to hit any bumpy air patches of air with my kids' teachers. And the thing is, every time someone comes to this mic and complains about a lesson, they only present an unrepresentative sliver of the lesson. They leave out the other side of the pro-con article. They leave out what the purpose of the lesson actually was, and most of the time it was critical thinking or how to construct a persuasive essay, which is impossible to do without a subject matter on which to persuade. If some of the board are curious why there is a retention issue, I'll offer up my opinion. Disrespect for education by some of the community and especially some of the Board of Education. Disrespect for the years of education and training required by the many teachers, staff, and administrators. I just want our teachers, staff, and administrators to feel respected and to let them know that there are many in the community that still have respect and administration for their, and excuse me, have respect and admiration for what they do. We are not going away either. As always, thank you for your time and who day. Thank you, Mr. Argo. Would you like to, we had several comments on Zoom participation. Would you like to weigh in on that? I, I mean, we will research it and we'll make it happen if that is the will of the board. We did it before, um, it, I think right now, So, and someone pointed this out, it's basically a self-reporting. Mm -hmm. like, are you a resident? Yes or no? If you lie, it's on you. Um, and so I guess it would be the same way again, if that is the will of the board. And it's not to limit we'll, anybody, but I know that some places have, have issues. Um, we just have to have a mute button. 
so to speak, if something came up. That's it. Otherwise, I think we could probably figure that out. Mm -hmm. So it's a continuing conversation, I would say, that perhaps we yeah. can get some more research on how other districts are handling this. Yep. Should we put that into the conversation on the public participation in our policy meeting? Great idea. I'll we be can do some research people. before the policy committee. Mm -hmm. I'm going to guess that Mr. Wesley already has an answer for us, <laughs> and he will share that with us. Yeah. We can refer that to our community engagement committee once you have some research ready to talk about. Okay. Um, several comments tonight. I think I responded already to Mrs. H. And Mr. Minch uh, talked about curriculum and wanted to express concerns with the proposed curriculum uh, policy. Mr. Buckingham and Mrs. Mal, both the Code of Cares. Thank you for starting that. I, I've been participating with that on Facebook too and really appreciate the engagement you have with families. I think it's a great place for that to happen. Mrs. Greer talked about special needs and about the resolution. Mrs. Richardson talked about concern with the curriculum policy, uh, talked about masking versus unmasking at Super Bowl, which was mentioned earlier and concerns with the resolution. Uh, Mrs. Ruder talked about an email that she had sent and board behavior and what she felt were twisted policies. Mrs. Cameron did a thank you to everyone, particularly our staff and teachers and administrators, and talked about uh, Zoom participation and about the curriculum policy. Mrs. Souls peters talked about Zoom participation. Mr. Horton expressed support for the teachers discussed public participation, and then he valued some of those changes to the public participation and the discussion tonight. And Mr. Argo talked about um, disrespect as an issue and a retention issue. It also talked about uh, the proposed curriculum policy. And Mr. Argo, my, my husband, as an airline pilot, had plenty of people after a round of turbulence say to him, I could fly this plane better than you. So <laughs> I, I think he would have appreciated your comments tonight. And thank you for your expression of concern as well. It's appreciated. Is there anything else? I have, can I ask? Let, one second. Um, Superintendent Alderman Treasurer, anything else on public comment? No, I think you covered it. Thank you. Board? Mr. Buckingham and your Lakota Cares partner, thank you for starting that organization. If you could, email me or email us, what are some of your concerns for the special needs community that need addressed currently? And how can we support you in um, finding these resolutions? Thank you, Mrs. Bodie. Anyone else? All right, we'll go with closing comments. We'll start with you. So, the Lakota District, I just want to have a final say, the Lakota District is not the health department. And to engage in these health issues as we have, I believe, is a definition of reckless behavior. Let's let the professionals come to, con to a consensus before we act. When the health departments are in possession of data and research that clearly says we have a serious health threat, I trust they will act accordingly and not only use their proper authority to require certain protocols, but they would also make that information available to the public. I encourage every member of the Lakota community, especially the parents, to read the resolution and the materials that have been supported, that have been submitted in support of. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Bodie, Mrs. Schaefer. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Appreciate everyone taking their time and choosing this uh, to be the way that they spent their day. Um, appreciate, again, all the staff that needed to be here tonight rather than with their families. Um, and it just shows how much you care about the kids and the families in this district. So thank you. Thank you. Um, just yes, again, thank you all for coming and spending Valentine's Day with us. And I can't believe no one brought us chocolate. <laughs> very very sad about that no we do appreciate you coming um and um speaking your minds we like to hear from our community so that's all in the interest of we still have the executive session to do thank you mrs casper we'll ignore the bribe you just asked for, well so. you know that's okay under 25 dollars that's, that's, right. right. that's right yeah don't make the candy more than 25 dollars <laughs> <laughs> mr d okay uh thanks 
Thank you everyone for being here today, despite the fact that it's Valentine's Day. Uh, just summary, I am for mask freedom. If you want your kids to wear a mask, let them wear a mask. If you don't want your kids not to wear a mask, they should not wear a mask. And then there shouldn't be stigma for either wearing or not wearing a mask. That's the freedom I want to give back to the parents. Curriculum audit, the last time we had was 2016. Every time there should be uh, a review. We have to do a review on whatever is it in your life. From time to time, you look back. It's curriculum audit to make sure the teachers are teaching exactly what is in the curriculum. It's not that you're changing the curriculum. Then public participation is very cr critical. And I'm glad we're here. We didn't limit people from speaking, even though the policy has not gone through. Thank you so much for being here today. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mr. Dean. This is Logan. Um, I know we've been sitting here for a while. <laughs> um, and it's easy to forget how we started the meeting, but um, we had two students here tonight. And so, um, sorry. Um, but it is always my favorite part of the meeting, as I'm sure it's all of our favorite part of the meeting. Um, and I just wanted to reflect and go back again and say congrats, not just to those students, but to their families. It's always so nice to see the pride in the families' eyes and to watch their student be recognized. Um, and to the administrators and the teachers, I mean, who are here and support those kids on a daily basis. Um, and so just uh, congrats to those kids again, perfect scores. Um, and congrats to our, our staff members who support them every day and to their families. So that's it. Oh, you took the words out of my mouth, but that's no, it's good. And um, it's good that we recognize them and got to start the meeting with them. And I think it's good that we brought them up. So, and thanks to all the people that made comments on um, all the things going on in the district as we continue to move forward and move ahead and continue to evolve and do good things for kids. You know, it is hard being the last one to speak. It really is. All the good stuff to yourself. I'll do my best. <laughs> um, echoing the comments about our two students, 15 across the nation. That's terrific, and I'd love to see more of that. It's wonderful news. I had a chance to go this week to Liberty uh, Early Childhood Center to Mrs. Hare's class, and I got this beautiful thank you card from the kids today. Thanks for coming to Liberty and reading to us. And that, that was great fun. And, and they could talk your ear off. They seriously couldn't. It was, it was just really neat to see those faces and the smiles on them. And they were so engaged. And they had clearly had a great teacher telling them how to be great listeners. So thank you for that invitation. It was wonderful. So my dad was a terrible punster. I mean, he would make people groan. So in honor of my dad tonight, you're all sweethearts for being out here with us. Happy Valentine's Day. Thank you. We are going to move into executive session. I'll take a motion to enter into executive session for the purpose of the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee, official licensee, or regulated individual. So moved. Thank you, Julie. Second. Thank you, Isaac. Jenny. Mrs. Schaefer. Yes. Mr. Adi. Yes. Mrs. Casper. Yes. Mrs. Bodie. Yes. Mrs. O'Connor. Yes. We are going to be meeting in here, so we'll give you a couple of minutes to, to uh, leave us to the rest of the evening. I've got to stand. Oh, 